This is Bazaar Morning Call. Broadcasting live from the CNBC TV 18 Motilal Oswal Studios in Mumbai. Good morning, you're with us here on a fresh new edition of Bazaar Morning Call. We are coming to you live from the CNBC TV 18 Motilal Oswal Studios. It's a Wednesday morning. Uh, we, of course, uh, you know, markets uh, are going to be the focus. Yesterday was flat. Can today be different? There's a big data point ahead of us, which is the US CPI, but that's only later tonight. Tomorrow is a stock market holiday as well. Uh, I mean, so it's going to be an interesting setup as we begin this session. I'm Prashant. Sonia is with me and Reema joins us today on the program. Guys, hi, morning. Hi, good morning, Prashant. Hi, good, good morning, morning. Reema. And you know, so many cues on Friday as well, right? You have TCS earnings, you have Bharti Hexacom's listing, you have the US, uh, sorry, the India CPI data and as well. And the IIP data. And the IIP data. So there's so much to look forward to. But all this is going to come post-market as except the Bharti Hexacom listing. Yes. So lots of, of course, uh, things to watch today. Oh, absolutely. And, uh, you know, the point is because tomorrow is a holiday, uh, it also kind of, you've got, to, you've got that in the mix as well. So if you're trading, uh, I mean, that becomes important because you'll be kind of sort of reacting to uh, some of this stuff. Now, uh, just to kick off things, right, we'll begin where we left off yesterday, which is, of course, the flat close. I mean, absolutely flat uh, yesterday. Large caps for the second day running, like Monday, uh, Tuesday, that is yesterday, outperforming small and mid caps. Although small caps did not do too badly. Bank Nifty, private banks participated at the margin. Uh, but, I mean, all in all, it didn't really go anywhere, directionally speaking, although we had a high, uh, big pop, right? So, from the highs, the market did come off quite a bit, but as expected. Now, overnight, U.S. Ex equities are higher. S&P is up a little bit. The Nasdaq is up about a third of a percent. Yields have dropped a, a big time. There is no real impulse or no real big data point which would have perhaps cost it, but we're back at about 4.35 after you know, getting to about 4.45. So the 10-year dropped about seven basis points. Dollar index absolutely flat, 104.1. Uh, but, I mean, it's now closer to 104 than it's been to 105 recently. Oil prices are also down about 1%. And, uh, you know, the high was 91. From 91, we're at about 89.48. I mean, this is all incremental. But then, I mean, when you're tracking markets day on day, what matters is the marginal movement or the incremental move. Now, uh, global markets, as I said, are awaiting the US CPI number. And this is important. In the last six months, the CPI has uh, gotten out a strong market reaction on the way up, on the way down. Uh, and this is important because we've had strong data which is going in one direction and you've got Fed speak, especially from Fed Chair Powell, which is going in another direction. Powell, uh, of course, has been saying that, well, you know, he'd like to cut. Data, of course, is stronger. Take labor market data, the monthly jobs data. We've had three months of blowout labor market data which has come through. I mean, the last one, of course, we got last week. Now, uh, a soft CPI print quit, quit, could quickly reprice a June cut. I mean, the probability of June cut perhaps will go up sharply higher if the print is softer. The core number is expected about, the consensus is at about 0.28%. Now, market is pricing in 64 basis points of cuts by the end of this year, starting with the first cut in September. And this is, by the way, this, this market pricing is the most hawkish that we've had since October of 2023. So given all of this, I think it becomes important to track which way the number comes through. Now, just to circle back and tie in the levels of the market for the Nifty, keep supports very, very close by supports at about 22,580. Uh, so roughly about 22,600, which is about, uh, you know, 40, 60 points away from where we are. That's the trailing reversal kind of a near-term stop. And uh, on the way up, I mean, we put this level out yesterday as well. I think upside targets are pending. Weekly upper Bollinger Band stands it. You're basically now using extensions because the market's at an all-time high. That number stands at 22,955 for the Nifty. The Nifty Bank can uh, look to target 49,257, again, uh, based on uh, the weekly bands. Uh, so that's the upside level. And the support for the Nifty Bank can be kept at 48,200. These are hourly averages. Uh, the 40 hourly, which uh, we are looking at as far as the Nifty Bank is concerned. So, I mean, you know, the setup is quite decent. The Gift Nifty will come up on your screen. Uh, the, Of course, you know, the CPI number will be important, but the, the complication in that sense is that we will not be there to react to it tomorrow morning, whatever comes our way uh, and, and how the U.S. markets react. That's only going to be day after, which is on a Friday morning. It's like a opening, that was, you know, yesterday, same time, uh, Gift Nifty was indicating a 90-point higher start, and I was saying... Nine, I mean, that seemed excessive. We got a 90-point start, and then we got a completely flat close. Uh, so we'll see. Uh, cues, of course, from the global arena are a bit more positive today as compared to yesterday. 
but it's a big data point. So, uh, you know, if you're trading day on day, I mean, better to be a little cautious at the margin. You can always get back in once you have certainty which way the number is coming. Sonia. Oh, absolutely. And I think, you know, the implied opening is suggesting a very strong opening for our own markets, yeah. right? Almost 90 points higher. And uh, if you look at the data points, it indicates that the uptrend is pretty much intact for our own markets. Even the global markets, they were very quiet. The Dow and the S&P closed flat, but still very stable at all-time highs. If you look at our own markets, the Nifty has been really strong at the 22,600 mark. And, uh, you know, the question I'm asking is, is this the, a bit of a breather before the uptrend resumes in the market? Because look at the data points, right? Uh, there was large buying from domestic institutions yesterday. DI has bought almost uh, 2,300 crores in the cash markets. Uh, we've also had, uh, you know, a situation where gold is hitting record highs and we've talked ad nauseum about that, about how there is so much buying from central banks across the world, especially China buying so much gold. So is there a tectonic shift of the, uh, you know, powers at play away from the West and into the East because of large buying that China is seeing in gold and uh, hedging themselves against the US dollar? So that is something that the street is looking at as well. Um, there are a lot of things to watch on Friday. Tomorrow, of course, is a market holiday, but there's TCS earnings post-market hours, there's the Bharti Hexacom listing, there's the CPI inflation data, and that is important to judge what the next step of the RBI will be, whether there are any rate cuts that could come through earlier than expected. So, a lot of cues to watch out for this week. But I reckon today would be a good day uh, for the markets overall, and especially for some of these pockets like banks, etc., that have been assuming leadership in the past few days. For now, uh, the Asian markets are also doing quite well, actually. The Hong Kong market is up almost 1.5%. So it looks like it's going to be a pretty good start. Absolutely. Hang Seng's up 1.2%. But uh, you've got a little bit of softness in the Japanese market. That's down 0.3%. And markets in Singapore and South Korea are shut today on account of Eid. So they're celebrating the Eid holiday today while we have a holiday tomorrow. Uh, but today is also the Nifty Bank weekly expiry. So keep your eye on that. And tomorrow's weekly expiry for the Nifty 50 has been pre-pawned. So today you've got the Nifty Bank weekly expiry and the Nifty 50 weekly expiry uh, taking place um, today. So just keep that on your mind. Well, absolutely. And uh, uh, Rima, thanks very much uh, for that. Well, we'll uh, get to more in just a bit, but uh, I'll tell you what's lined up here, like uh, in, the la in the next six, uh, 30 minutes or so. So Cameroon brand of EPFR Global will join in to discuss flows that's coming up uh, right after uh, now. Our research team gets you the top 10 stocks to watch out for with our research team uh, that's also lined up. And uh, we have our market guest, Devin Choksi of DR Choksi Finsa, who will be with us uh, with uh, specific names uh, in news and, of course, what he'd like, to, like you to bet on. All right, uh, let's kickstart the show with a view coming in from Rhythm Desai of Morgan Stanley, who says that the margin expansion will likely continue to drive earnings growth. He says the top line growth may remain tepid. He adds India continues to be in the midst of an earnings upcycle and there are buyers of financials, consumer discretionary, industrials and technology while avoiding external facing sectors. So money market views as well. This is Konal Sudhani of Shinan Bank who says US Fed officials are playing good cop, bad cop. Uh, leaving market participants to decide for themselves, he says the outcome of the inflation figures will set the tone for the market bets on the Fed, while today's FOMC minutes are important to watch as well. He says the dollar index finds resistance at 104.85. For the rupee here, the dollar rupee, Kunal says 83.1 to the dollar acts as a support, while 83.35 is the resistance. And, and on the bonds, you have Neeraj Gambhir of Axis Bank, who says during the week, bonds remain under pressure. On account of a rise in US Treasury as well as crude oil, he also says India MPC maintained the status quo and reiterated that inflation needs to moderate on a durable basis, diminishing any rate cut expectations. He adds that Friday's stronger than expected US non-farm payroll data supported the Fed's patient approach about rate cuts. Neerat says the new 10-year bond came in at 7.1% at Friday's auction and he expects the 10-year benchmark bond yield to trade in a range of 7.1% to 7.2% and take cues from the CPI data this week. We have also a lot of stock-specific action that we'll be tracking and we'll get to it in just a bit in our special top 10 segment. We're looking at Sham Metallics, Lupin, Pesa Low Digital and Godavari Power. Uh, these are stocks which are likely to open in the green, while Protein, eGov, Paytm, Motilal Oswal Financial Services, Latent View, ONGC Oil India are the stocks on our radar that are likely to open in the red. Okay, let's take a quick break on that note. On the other side of the break, we'll try and get, uh, you know, a global view on the market. But we also have our list of top 10 stocks coming up with our entire research team. Stay with us.
All right, welcome back. Uh, well, uh, lots of things to watch out for this morning. First and foremost, of course, the market opening will be positive. The gift nifty is indicating a higher start, so we take it from there. 80 points higher now. Uh, Mark Mobius, the chairman in Mobius Emerging Opportunities Funds, uh, is someone we spoke to a while back, and Mark expects a major growth potential in the railway sector in India. He adds tech and infra will see increased investments if Prime Minister Modi is re elected. Listen in. You look at the long term. India looks terrific. Uh, uh, it's got the right population structure. Uh, now with uh, China slowing down, India is going to be taking up the slack in terms of manufacturing and exports. So India is in a very good position. There's no question about it. I believe that uh, the position of most investors around the world are beginning to change. Uh, they've, of course, been burned very badly in China, and they're looking for another place in which to invest. And India seems to be the logical choice. Now, of course, for global investors, uh, they've been making good money in Japan. Uh, the U.S. market has done very well. But at the end of the day, uh, India is now beginning to outperform the U.S. market. And it makes sense for people to look at India. Now, of course, there's a problem of size. Uh, there needs to be more equity offerings in India more IPOs, and hopefully more uh, government enterprises being uh, uh, listed in the market. Because, uh, as you know, uh, India has some very large government enterprises that could be listed. We're seeing, of course, is Modi becoming stronger politically. In other words, uh, uh, it looks like he's going to have a, a larger, uh, a stronger position in the political structure of the Indian market. And that is very good news for investors because it means that he's going to continue to push for uh, technology in India and the application of technology. That's number one. Number two, he's going to be pushing more for infrastructure. I'm very, very interested in infrastructure. I believe that uh, that would be a very uh, high growth area. Uh, well, uh, the rail sector is very, very interesting, and the air airline sector is also interesting. All right, that's Mark Mobius, uh, one of the uh, preeminent emerging market investors. Still, India remains the top bet. Cameron Brand is director at, uh, director of research at EPFR Global Tracks Flows. Cameron, great to have you with us here. You heard Mobius there. Uh, is it showing through uh, in flows, uh, Cameron? Uh, India being the top uh, emerging market bet. You know, I was also, just to sort of preface my question, I was also listening to Ruchir Sharma, uh, who's, of course, with the Rockefeller uh, Institution. He said he, he was making a point that some of these uh, sort of emerging market ex-China strategies, uh, to him, he said, it's, it's, it seems like a fad. It's, it's, not, it's not possible that, you know, uh, it's just sort of coming and going. Uh, five years back, everybody wanted to go in on China. Now no one wants it, so it'll pass. So it's not a sustainable kind of a strategy. It's a fad. Just wanted your thoughts there. Uh, India and then China. Go on. Um, well, um, I'll, I'll start with the flows. Um, the flows to dedicated China funds are correcting again, um, being very flat despite the government's efforts to support the market. Uh, India remains, as I've said on a number of these calls, sort of the tall poppy in the emerging Asian field. Um, and after a slight lull over the past couple of weeks where flows haven't gone into reverse, but have been somewhat lower, uh, they picked up nicely last week and they look like this will be another solid week. Uh, you're certainly right that uh, we're seeing a lot more talk about how you uh, uh, invest with uh, an ex-China focus. Uh, <laughs> And I can understand anyone being skeptical. I've, uh, I've lived through BRICS, Frontier, Mint, Civets, MIST, uh, you name the acronym. I've seen it uh, pop up and fade. Um, that said, you know, I do think uh, the exposure to China in the gem funds that we tracked had, had gotten over a third of the average portfolio uh, just after the global pandemic broke. So I think in some ways what's going on is a fairly natural reversion to the mean, uh, given an extra boost by the much uh, 
more frosty relations between the, the U.S. and China uh, mm. and the, the sense that uh, the, the Halicon days of Chinese growth may, may well be over. Uh, since you're talking about frosty relationships between U.S. and China, right, what is your take on what's happening with the way gold is moving? Of course, we have seen large buying from the Chinese central bank. But the question is this, if countries globally are trying to reduce their reliance on the dollar as part of their foreign reserves, could this be the start of a tectonic shift in the global power center away from the West and into the East? And if yes, uh, what is the change in the dynamics in, you know, in something in risky assets like, say, equities? Well, I certainly think this is yet another effort to try and uh, uh, get out from underneath the dollar's uh, hegemony. Um, previous efforts to do so have not been successful. Uh, and given the fact there's a finite amount of gold, it's not particularly easy to move around. Uh, I'm not sure that this one uh, is going to work either. And though we're seeing sort of very sort of strong demand for gold at the moment and the price is going up, certainly at the fund level, really until the uh, till early this year, what we saw was uh, an investor cohort who thought that uh, cryptocurrencies might be a better alternative to owning gold. So um, until, until the trend establishes itself uh, much more firmly, uh, I'm, I'm cautious about reading too much into it. Mm. What about commodity-linked markets, markets which are beneficiaries of this big rise that we've seen in commodities, whether it's copper at a 15-month high, gold is at a lifetime high. Uh, any commodity-related place that investors are watching, given the upcycle that we've seen across the board? And is money flowing into any of these nations? Uh, yes, but it's uh, not so much an emerging market story at the moment. Uh, there's been sort of definitely higher interest in the two big develop what I call the big developed markets resource plays, uh, Australia and Canada. We've not been seeing a corresponding increase in interest in, say, places like Brazil, um, Argentina, uh, South Africa. Um, so it's a real trend, but people are playing it carefully. Mm. They're, they're going to all the safe places. Uh, no, got that, uh, <coughs> Cameron. Cameron, just a uh, quick word. You know, so interest rates, uh, we've, uh, uh, there's a big debate going on whether are you, somebody was earlier mentioning uh, they're playing good cop, bad cop. Uh, data is going one way, officials are saying something else. Uh, the point is, uh, does it all really matter? And, and in what degree, should, when we focus on interest rates in the West, right, uh, what is the implication? Because it's not herd equity rallies, which have been very strong over the last couple of years. Rates in the U.S. have got to five and a quarter percent. So what if they come down in June or July or September? Does it really matter? They shouldn't go higher. Do you think that's the way to kind of look at this entire interest rate uh, regime and where we go from here? Uh, I, I agree that sort of this uh, druid-like worship of the uh, current uh, Fed rate funds rate may be a bit overdone. Um, you know, when you look at interest rates as a whole, um, I, I still don't think enough uh, attention is being paid to the longer end of the curve. Huge debt issuance from uh, the U.S. and Europe, uh, both the... Uh, ECB and the Fed and the, and the Bank of England trying to run uh, uh, COVID era and, and great financial era uh, quantitative easing assets off their books. Um, so I, you know, I, I think uh, it'll be a nice shot in the arm, but uh, the, the real uh, action over any meaningful period of time is, is further out. And uh, you know, from where I sit, I think interest rates, certainly the 10-year you know, interest rates, uh, will be settled at a higher level than we've been used to. All right, Cameron, we leave it at that. Thanks a lot for joining in and uh, appreciate your thoughts on the Indian economies, emerging markets and how things could shape up from here. Well, our research team is standing by with a list of top 10 stocks as we begin the day. First up, Protean Egov is on our radar. Nimesh is here to tell us why he's watching that one. Nimesh, morning. Well, morning, Sonia. I'm watching out of a stock largely because there is going to be a large block deal. 5.3% uh, of the equity is going to change hands. 360 managed funds, uh, 361 managed funds are going to sell. Uh, this includes a green shoe as well. 
Interestingly, the price band has not been indicated. So not, you know, we need to see how the deal gets executed. If in the block deal, then the stock can can, can you know, start in the green. But otherwise, there could be a, 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 a bit of a pressure on the stock. Also because uh, the 360 managed funds owns close to 23% stake, and now they're selling only 5.5% stake. So the overhang can continue from this particular fund. So I'll go with the red to start with, but the block deal execution could be quite interesting uh, in the protein e-gown. Okay, thanks a lot, Nimesh, for that. So that's Protein Egov. But let's hop across to Hormuz now. He's tracking Paytm this morning. Hormuz, why are you watching that one? Plenty of news developments, Sonia. And uh, first up, the company shared its shareholding pattern for the March quarter last evening. And positive bit here is that both domestic and foreign funds have increased their stake in the company. And December, uh, com domestic mutual funds now own 6.1% stake in Paytm compared to the 5% that they owned in December. The foreign portfolio investors now own 20.2% as of March compared to the 17.7% that they held in December. So this despite the 40% drop that the Paytm stock saw during the January to March quarter. Now, that's where the positive bit ends because there are a couple of negative developments as well. Paytm's UPI market share has dropped to 9%. This is the lowest in four years that is as per a money control report and the transaction value market share is also down to 6.7% and they also informed the exchanges late last evening that the Paytm Payments Bank CEO Surinder Chawla has quit citing personal reasons and to explore better career opportunities. So some bit of positivity on the shareholding bit but the losing market share can take precedence and the stock may open in the red this morning. All right, uh, Hormuz, thanks very much for that. That's Paytm uh, Payments Bank and, of course, uh, the listed entity in focus there. Uh, now, Sham Metallics uh, is undertaking an uh, expansion. And, by the way, we'll be speaking with a company as well later. Lupin is the other one, which is in, all, uh, which is in focus as well. Vivek has got both those. Uh, Vivek, morning. Well, good morning. That's right. So, Sham Metallics is in focus. So, the company has gone ahead and announced an expansion into the stainless steel flat products. So, the company has gone ahead and established a new stainless steel hot oil coils facility at Odisha. This facility will be 0 0.3 uh, metric tons and will specialize in 200 and 400 series uh, stainless steel hot roll coils. The capital outlay that the company has envisaged is in the range of 650 to 750 crores. And the project is expected to be commissioned by the mid of, uh, cal uh, of fiscal year FI27. Uh, the other stock on the radar is Lupin, an incremental positive coming in there. The company has got an approval and has gone ahead and launched the first generic version of Orekia or doxycycline capsules in USA. This particular capsule is is used to treat inflammatory lesions uh, and this is a uh, skin condition. The estimated sales or the market size for this particular drug is $128 million. Positive news flow for both companies. Expect both the stocks to be in the green today. All right, thanks a lot for that. Vamakshi is also with us to tell us about some more stocks that are in the news. Vamakshi, over to you. Well, absolutely. Let me first start off with Mutila Loswal. The stock is on our radar because SEBI has issued an administrative warning. They have raised certain observations with respect to minor retail operation processes. The SEBI has uh, uh, advised the company to avoid the recurrence of the same. And the company, however, says that there is no impact yet on the financials or the operations. So, sentimentally negative news flow for Mutila Loswal. No major implications. So, expect the stock to open mildly lower. Pesalo Digital is another counter that we will be focusing on. AUM has grown up by almost 32% to 4,622 crores and this was largely led by the uh, uh, traction that we saw in the disbursements. Disbursements were up nearly 38%. Cool ending loan disbursements uh, also doubled uh, on a year-on-year -year basis and the customer franchise has also seen a very sharp jump. So given that, Pesalo Digital expected to open higher today. Latent View on the other hand is expected to lo uh, open lower and that is because Tarun Suresh, who is the head marketing and demand generation, has now resigned from uh, the post. Thank you very much for that, Vivek. Uh, it's back to him for IRB infrastructure. Vivek. Well, good morning. You know, uh, late last night, the company uh, gave an uh, announcement to the exchanges. So what's actually happened is that uh, the company, which has uh, multiple claims or arbitrations ongoing, uh, you know, in the arbitral tribunal against NHI, in one important case, has given an update to the exchanges. So in this particular case, the company was arguing against NHI and the company was claiming uh, a claim against the NHI. This is in the IRB AV, which is the IRB Ahmedabad Vadodara Super Express Tollway. The company had claimed a compensation of over 1,000 crore rupees from NHI because they said that there was a competing toll road that had started while this particular project was on. Uh, however, what has actually happened is that, and it appears to be a setback against IRB Infra, that the arbitral tribunal has gone ahead and rejected the claim of the company of close to 1,000 crore rupees. The company does have further legal recourse. Uh, the management will be joining us. We'll probe them more on that. But at least sentimentally, this particular development is a negative as far as IRB is concerned. 
All right, uh, Vivek. Uh, thanks very much. By the way, IRB is another management we'll have up uh, coming up over the next two hours or so. Speaking, and we'll uh, bring this up as well. Now, oil prices have slipped from 91 to 89 and a half odd uh, dollars. I mean, is the uh, sort of geopolitical political risk premium coming off a little bit? That's the top of mind question. Manisha is here with more details. Manisha, morning. Thank you for that, Prashant. Well, yes, it's a second straight day when we have the crude oil prices slipping off its uh, recent highs. So we are not trading at a five-month highs anymore. There is ongoing uh, diplomatic talks between Israel and Hamas. And Israel also has uh, suggested that they are reducing forces in Gaza. So that seems to be taking some premium off. Also, the latest API data shows that the U.S. inventories are bigger than expected at 3 million barrels of a buildup. Elevated OPEC spare capacity as they continue to keep production down also is something that the markets are keeping an eye on. Having said that, it is going to be about the U.S. inflation data. Well, that comes in today. And then it is also about various uh, banks and brokerages suggesting that it still are accumulation levels on the lower side for crude. Uh, Morgan Stanley, for one, expects $94 to come in within this quarter. And that is exactly what City, Goldman Sachs, etc. also say, that crude doesn't have too much of way on the downside. And every dip, perhaps, is a buying opportunity. All right, thanks a lot, Manisha, for that. Here's a quick recap. Stocks with positive news flow, there's Sham Metallics, Lupin and Pesalo Digital. Stocks with negative news flow, there's IRB Infra, Protein, EGov, Paytm, Motilal Hoswa, Latent View, ONGC and Oil India. But let's also get some brokerage notes to focus on for the day. Some upgrades have come through as well. So, Darshan is here to give us the latest on that. So, Darshan, morning. Morning, Sunaya. So first, I'll start with Vedanta. CLS has written on the stock. It has upgraded the stock to buy from underperformant target. It's raised to 390 from rupees 260 per share. It says company is well placed to benefit from commodity upcycle and efforts to raise capacity and profitability across segments augurs well. Leverage trajectory and corporate structure will be key to watch. Next is Motilal Oswal on MCX. It has upgraded, upgraded the stock to buy from neutral and target is raised to 4300 from 3940 per share. It says new products will be the key growth drivers and average daily traded volume in options segment may rise by 60% FY25. And analysis yields 7% rise in EPS for every rupees 10,000 crore additional ADTV in options. FY24-26 revenue, EBITDA and profit CAGR seen at 28%, 205% and 157% respectively. Jeffries on Godes Properties, it maintains buy rating, but target is raised to 3,175 from rupees 2,700 per share. Company has recorded best ever pre-sales amongst listed players in FY24 and Q4. And Jeffries believes FY25 can see growth over high base on timely land acquisitions and Hyderabad entry. And it expects much higher margin once new projects get executed. Last is Nomura and Alchem Labs. It maintains neutral rating. Target is rupees 5,605 per share. It says observations for buddy unit are somewhat concerning and it does not rule out possibility of an official action indicated classification. Buddy had contributed 8 to 10 percent to FY24 consolidated sales and Nomura believes planned two to three launches by the company from buddy unit may be delayed if it's classified as official action indicated. All right, Sudarshan, thanks a lot for that. Let's take a quick break on the other side, Devin Choksi of uh, DR Choksi Finser will be joining in for Fundamental Stock Analysis. Stay tuned. Welcome back. Uh, the metal index has been one of the best performing indices over the last couple of days. The Nifty metal index is a gain of close to about 8% in the month of April itself with names like Vedanta, Hindustan Copper 
or showing you up moves of 25 to 30 percent. Is there more upside in these stocks? Let me ask Devin Choksi, Managing Director, uh, who's at uh, DR Choksi FinServe, who's joining us on the show now. Uh, Devin, morning. Any metal stocks on your radar? Uh, this morning on Vedanta, we've got a CLSE double upgrade. So from an underperform, they've raised the rating to a buy. They've put the target price at 390. They believe the stock is well placed to benefit from the commodity upcycle. And this is benefiting a lot of the stocks uh, across in the metal universe. Any stock that you like? Yeah, Rima, good morning. <clears throat> we continue to uh, like the entire metal space per se. And we knew that I think this particular move that we are experiencing in the global environment is likely to be a long-term move, largely because of the fact that the amount of investment that each and every country is going to be making in the area of renewables I think, and also in the area of, I think, the uh, cloud computing, we believe that eventually, I think the requirement of metals for building the variety of infrastructure is going to be on a higher side. Come to India per se, uh, infrastructure spending in the country and is going to demand more and more amount of commodity going forward as well. So from a perspective of looking at the long-term trend, as far as the industry is concerned, it remains absolutely strong and convincing. Some of the companies which are looking relatively more stable now uh, is companies like Tata uh, Steel, particularly. We have been seeing that de bottlenecking process is also helping the company in increasing the production as well as in sales. And at the same time, I think the higher amount of uh, uh, cost savings that they are basically getting into due to the use of alternate energy mechanism, which is allowing them to uh, create the possibility of higher margins going for the sustainable margins. So we continue to like companies like Tata Steel, continue to like, I think, JSW Steel. Uh, maybe, I think, uh, sale uh, also along with, where we feel that I think the business conditions definitely supporting them. For say on the Vedanta, the restructuring of the group is suggesting that the group is getting out of the pain points which they have up till now been experiencing. And if the balance sheet do get corrected, which in all, all likelihood in the next one or two years, I think will, so in such situation, I think the rating of the company and the stock is definitely due given the kind of strength of commodity that they have. So all in all put together, we have a positive direction for the, the commodity space, in particular the metal, terrace and workers included. Hmm. Devin, hi, good morning. I want your thoughts on Bharti mm -hmm. Hexacom. The listing is on Friday. Uh, if someone, you know, missed out on the IPO, post listing, does it make sense to buy? Uh, good morning, Sonia. Honestly, I haven't looked at this particular proposition, so I think we'll wait for some more time before I study. Oh, okay, okay. Got it. I'll ask you, you know, post-listing again. Uh, what about TCS? Sure. Numbers come out post-market hours on Friday. Any thoughts on how to approach this one? So, uh, we believe that I think TCS, Infosys, both of them will uh, be talking out, I think, some amount of uh, strong commentaries going forward. Uh, the last year, they have been quite circumspect about the continuity of the inflow of orders. This year, probably, I think that situation is to a greater extent, I think, more women predictable in power, I think, getting the higher amount of orders. Though the volume or the jump may not be as sharp, but we believe that the long-term contracts with billion-dollar orders, I think, which they are basically going to have an impact, is going to drive the uh, relatively more amount of stability as far as the uh, continuity and the business is concerned. Largely, few points, I think, which are working in favor of the IT majors, and they, one of them, and very strongly, uh, is the computation uh, space in which most of the companies are getting into data computation space, in which most of these companies are cornering more orders. We believe that, I think, with the AI uh, search which is happening, probably are likely to see a larger amount of, uh, I think, the business is coming in from that counter. So, relatively we remain strong on TCS. So, we may expect around 15% or kind of an appreciation. Should the stock give some correction, it could be, I think, somewhere around 20% as well. But 50 to 20% kind of uh, upside is possible over 12 to 15 months time in this stock. Uh, <clears throat> been morning. Uh, in real yeah. estate, uh, what's, uh, what's the top idea? I mean, Nimesh was telling us about that uh, upgrade from on Godrej's property, strongest pre-sales numbers in that pack so far. Uh, but uh, what's what are your ideas there? So, good morning, Prashant. So, from quarter to quarter, I think the position may change as far as the number of ideas are concerned or maybe the names are concerned. Um, Godrej's property certainly, I think, demands more closer look now with the higher amount of uh, square feet under construction. 
and the delivery. Fortunately, the demand scenario remains absolutely strong for condition, and as a result of which, I think the uh, uptake also remains absolutely very, very convincing. At the same time, in the second half of the financial year, we are likely to see the fall in the interest rates, and that could add into this particular momentum for real estate. The larger ones with a higher amount of capacity to deliver would definitely be the both risk, the other is included. Uh, we believe that I think they are the ones who could possibly uh, uh, be showing relatively stronger amount of uh, growth. Some of the regional players like Shoba and Prestige, I think Prestige of course can't be called as completely regional now, but I think they are the ones who are largely going to be uh, uh, benefiting given the kind of size of uh, project and the individuals. The other stock that I wanted to ask you about was Paytm because you know uh, there is a lot of brokerages are now resuming their coverage on Paytm. Bofa Securities, in fact, resumed their coverage. They are talking about how the business growth is picking up gradually, and uh, there is a re-rating underway, but that could be two three quarters down the road. Uh, do you concur with that view? So, Sonia, I think it is safer to wait for those two, three quarters and then possibly bring up the view. Largely because of the fact that this company's business model has been probably, I think, always is somewhere. I think they have been initially, initial period, I think they're somewhere they were having growth as a focus area. Profitability was not. Subsequently, profitability came into the focus and I think now the growth is going away. So, I would think that uncertainty factors are quite many. And from that perspective, I would like to wait and see how exactly I see the visibility over the next few quarters. Should one get the visibility, then definitely one will have to look at it. In my understanding, this company will have to undergo a massive transformation as far as the business model is concerned. But that's a subject I think which one can talk at length as far as I think what kind of transformation that we are experiencing, likely to experience from this business model. Okay. Okay. Uh, Devane, do stay on. Uh, let me invite the first management on the show today. That's Paris Defence. The stock has gained 43% in the last one year. In a recent note, Nirmal Bang has said, with the government pushing for more make in India, there is more headroom for revenue generation. To discuss the outlook on railway heavy engineering business, we've got Amit Mahajan, Director Technical R&D at Paris Defence and Space Technologies joining in. Thank you very much for joining in. This is Reema here. Can you talk about the order accretion that the company has seen in this Jan to March quarter and what does it take your order book to and the pipeline going ahead? Good morning, Reema. Uh, firstly, thank you for having me over. Uh, I cannot uh, divulge absolute number because I'm in a silent zone. But uh, the order book has been, if you see uh, for Paris Defense and for that matter, all Indian manufacturing companies has been doubling up uh, year on year. Uh, I would want to maintain a order book of two and a half to three times of my revenue, which has been, which has been very, very healthy. This sector has never seen something like this. And this is the effect of uh, the snowball effect of uh, you know, all the indigenization that we talk about. So, can you give us, uh, you know, some uh, uh, sort of um, ba ballpark band on the margin front as well? Uh, your cost of materials has gone up quite a bit actually. So, that's hit your margins a bit. I mean, it's still at around 22% or so, but it's uh, far off from, you know, 27, 28% you used to enjoy a couple of years ago. Can you tell us what is the outlook on margins in the next one to two years? So, uh, look at Paris Defence uh, or for that matter any defence company as a yearly basis, not on a quarterly basis. So, if you look at the yearly margins, they are going to be sustainable. Uh, the revenues will grow steadily and the opportunity that is lying in front of us is humongous. As we speak and I am telling you two, two and a half or three, three times the revenue is the order book I have. But at the same time, my opportunity is almost 10x. So that's something that uh, we need to be focusing on. That is the kind of uh, businesses I'm uh, looking to envisage coming my way in the next few months to come. So revenues, uh, margins, they will all be on the upward side. Okay, got it. So you're focusing more on the opportunity and, and less on profitability at this point in time. Understood. Can you tell us what exactly is the order book that you're sitting on right now? And what is the kind of order visibility? What is the execution that you're staring at over the next one to two years? So, order book right now is in excess of uh, 600 crores, like I mentioned. And we retain that. 
and execution capability like i'm telling you even in this quarter in the quarter to come we will uh, book sizable orders and we will maintain two two and a half uh, 3x uh, of our revenue when it comes to order book uh, the the execution capability we do need not augment our capabilities because our capabilities are extremely scalable and we should be able to sustain uh, revenue growth for the next five years mm. uh, with high morning <clears throat> so uh, the size of the opportunity is large and that is true uh, for all defense companies as you said right there's a big making uh, local localization effort which is going on so uh, and so the orders are the pipeline is strong and it'll, it'll perhaps remain strong but it's about execution right uh, now uh, how uh, give us some sense i think the last time we spoke you said uh, this year numbers should be up uh, 30 between 30 and 40% uh, without being very specific since you said you're in the silent period uh, talk to us about whether you end up in that ballpark. Uh, what are the what are the expectations in terms of executions, revenues you will book uh, in uh, F525? Growth would suffice. Go on. So, so Paris Defense is a is a project oriented company. I always maintain. From there, we are migrating from a component or a subsystem manufacturer company to a large system manufacturing company. The revenue execution capabilities do not change or they are much much scalable but what can happen here is 10 15 20 percent plus or 10 15 20 percent lower the growth will is sustainable there will be growth how much percentage that's something which year on year maybe this year if i do something next year does not become a yardstick for uh, my growth that way Say, I, I will give an example. One product which I'm making, Submarine Periscope, is a very high value when it comes to the percentage of it uh, with respect to the revenue of Paris Defense. So if I have to deliver, say, a Periscope on in March, but for some operational reasons, I have to deliver it in April, a large chunk of my uh, revenues uh, get shifted to the next financial year. So these things are a part and parcel of the business and should be looked at uh, in a larger gamut of things. The order book and the opportunity, I would always want to focus on. The capability to execute these orders are well stocked up the, with, with uh, margins for growth for the next five years. So I, I don't see uh, a growth percentage should be uh, focused on. Okay. Uh no, I mean, uh, growth... <laughs> Uh, so, so, no, that's why I said, I mean, it's a 30 to 40 is a wide range, right? So is that is that broadly, roughly what we should look at? I would widen that range depending on okay. year to year. Uh, I, I, I may say that this year it can be around that or I, I don't want to put figures there, right? But right. Uh, next year can be higher than that. Subsequent okay. year can be lower than that. But... Uh, what what yardstick we should look at is sure. the kind of opportunities that we're going. Got it. Uh, now, Ajay, when, just, I, when uh, I'm saying this, when I'm saying this, yeah. I will still maintain that whatever happens, we mm. sustain our profitability. That's yeah. that's important. Okay, so give us a number. What will that uh, profitability number be? Uh, margins which you hope to sustain. You, you and be, second, be, just I, identify two or three. Uh, uh, I mean, th two or three areas. You said that uh, the periscope. Uh, without going into too much detail. Uh, what are you focused on? Uh, some of the some of the products that uh, are, will will give you visibility, uh, will give, so which have, give you visibility and confidence for uh, order book to remain very strong. Go on. So we have uh, two uh, primary verticals of our company: optics and optronic system. That will lead our revenues at all times because that is the most profitable business that we do. The second is defense engineering gives us the the run rate or the or the uh, flexibility of cash flow. So both these businesses do 50-50% right now. The profit are profits are mainly driven by the optics division. I would want to maintain optics as my front line because here uh, what we do in certain uh, segments in defense or in space, uh, nobody else in the country does. So I would want to retain that position of mine. I would want to focus on optics and optronic systems. Said that, electromagnetics, uh, so we are into electromagnetic pulse protection. Now, this is a domain, again, where we don't have much competition and we would want to also grow in this particular area. Defense Electronics is growing by its own virtue because we are there in almost all the programs in the defense sector. So, all in all, if you see, I would want to focus on optics, optronic systems, 
uh, I would want to focus on uh, electromagnetics. I would want to focus on defense ele uh, electronics. And then our subsidiaries kick in. So the drones and the anti-drone systems. Anti-drone system is slated to become very, very big in the coming uh, months to come. So I would want to focus on these four, five areas. Okay. Uh, Amit, just a quick word. On 5th of April, Ikra downgraded your outlook to a negative from a stable. The rating is reaffirmed, but the outlook has been downgraded to a negative. And that's reflecting, that's based on the deterioration in your operating margins, the decline that we've seen. And here they're saying is that the contribution of optics has gone down, while the contribution of the lower margin defense engineering has gone up. Um, so, you know, talk to us a little bit about that. And two, the increase in working capital, in, you know, uh, capital intensity, there is a stretch in your receivables, and that has moderated your liquidity position. So can you talk about this receivables that you have, your liquidity position, and has there been a deterioration, and are you looking to change that? So, uh, I, again, I, I would again always come to the same point that Paris Defense should, or for that matter, any defense manufacturing company should not be looked at on a quarterly, quarterly basis. Couple of quarters where my defense engineering, because my defense engineering turnaround times are much faster, like I mentioned before. So if they uh, give a revenue in a particular quarter, my profitability may look on the face of it lower than otherwise. But as, as I end the year, my consolidation happens on my profitability and I land up sustaining my last year's profitability. So quarter on quarter basis, if somebody is going to rate us, then yes, there is going to be a fluctuation. Ikra today downgraded the uh, outlook from positive to negative. But mm. maybe in the next couple of months, they will not just upgrade the outlook, but they may land up giving us a better rating. So this is where the business has to be understood that it is not sure. on quarterly basis, it's on a yearly basis. And what about the receivables, the deterioration in working capital and liquidity? Again, they are seasonal, right? So at the end of the year, Am I am I bettering my working capital cycles? Am I uh, reducing my uh, days? This is something which I target on a yearly basis, not on a quarter basis. Got it. Amit, we leave it at that. Thanks a lot for joining in and, uh, you know, sharing your thoughts with us on the business, the way forward, and of course, the order book picture as well. Uh, Devin Choksi is still sitting by with us. Devin, any thoughts? I mean, this has been a very strong stock. In the last 12 months, it's, all, it's up almost about 40-50%. Uh, do you think there's more on the upside, given that there is so much of a government push as well in the sector? Yes, Sonia, I think that is the only strength that, that I see in this particular area where most of the companies are probably seeing the kind of uh, order inflows and the business condition being for them. It's nowhere before that I think they have seen anything. Uh, you look at the size of the company, uh, what 250 odd crore kind of a top line. And uh, I think the size of the business that is coming to you is quite huge. Uh, the bigger challenge, as I see in this business, is I think to maintain the kind of financial stability in the business. Because on one side, when you study this business, you find that I think the requirement of the uh, the product is quite stringent. So which means I think that I think there is a longer cycle to produce it. On the other side, the working capital intensity is also increases because of, I think, the requirement of uh, production and then supply. And at the same time, I think receivables. Uh, on one side, you get larger orders. On the other side, you have to manage the financials. Some of the smaller companies are real, going to be really testing themselves in this particular environment. But what we get, I think, a positive feel out of this particular feel out of this particular activity. Most of the promoters and the corporates are very, including, I think, the company which you had, uh, the profit right now, they probably are ready in, I think, in order to face these challenges. So hopefully they will meet. Only thing that the market should not give them crazy valuation. If they do, then probably I think the punishment will come on their way. Otherwise, I think one will have to buy these companies when the market is opposite to all levels. Mm. What about this rise in gold prices? Uh, does it open up a play on any of the jewellery companies, Kalyan, Senko, or even these gold financiers like a Muthut Manapuram? So, well, I believe, Rima, I have the amount of disposable income in the hands of people increasing is certainly going to create this particular model much stronger. We have seen how Titan has traveled this particular, Tanishka has traveled this journey. I guess I think the second tier companies are already forming on their base in this particular environment. And I certainly, I think, would like to believe that I think the business condition would remain strong given the kind of demand appetite that, uh, demand that they are seeing in this particular space. 
but this would remain cyclical as i understand so wouldn't be very very sure about how do i to value this companies i may probably i think would see that yeah the business condition is improving the business activity is improving but so would be the requirement of additional resources in form of stores in form of branding etc we'll have to wait and see on the valuation uh, to the potential demand from all right uh, devin uh, thanks for that we'll do one thing we have 10 minutes to go before the pre opening rates kick in so let's do one thing let's take a break on the other side we'll get some technicals of the market going vitesh thakkar sudarshan sukhani will join in do stay tuned in Welcome back. You're with us here on uh, Bazaar Morning Call. There's uh, what eight minutes to go for the pre-open session uh, to kick off. Gift Nifty is indicating a 90 point higher start, so that's very strong. Mitesh is with us, and so is Sudarshan with their technical trading ideas. Uh, gentlemen, good morning. Good to have both of you here. Uh, Mitesh, uh, absolutely flat kind of close yesterday. Maybe just a bit of a pause, but uh, how are things looking? Like yesterday, the Gift Nifty is indicating a strong start higher. We got a strong start yesterday as well, but then it kind of fizzled out. Your thoughts on what to do? Uh, morning, Prashant. See, I think you know. Uh, yesterday, uh, I think the idea was that the bank Nifty was around this previous highs of forty-eight thousand seven hundred six hundred zones. And I think you know, while it did close in positive and just above forty-eight seven hundred, the breakout uh, wasn't you know fully uh, showing that strength, and therefore the Nifty was also having a subdued session. My sense is that the trend remains on the upside, and we should see higher highs. uh for the nifty i think 22 uh, 530 22 520 now becomes the immediate support pivot which was the earlier intraday highs and till that is taken out stay positive and i think we should see levels close to about 22 950 and on the bank nifty as well the idea is to be trading with a positive bias uh, for targets of 49 450 49 500 mm. Uh, Sudarshan is also with us. Uh, good morning, Sudarshan. Um, you know, yesterday, you know, it's encouraging to see the markets make fresh highs every single day, but it's not closing at those levels. In today, you are seeing that dip, and even yesterday, the markets came off from the day's high to close flat. Uh, how are you reading the market mood? Yeah, good morning. <coughs> see, the markets will do their own thing intraday. It's not necessary that they follow a rule or a set pattern month after month, day after day. So yesterday the markets opened with a gap up. Somebody must have thought this is a good idea to sell, and that's the end of it. The larger picture is what should should interest us. The bigger picture is that the uptrend is intact. Support levels once once made are not broken. So till those support levels hold, we stay long in this market and just ignore these you know these minor blips are really buy on dips opportunities for savvy traders. We shouldn't worry about it. So my level now is twenty two thousand five hundred. Below that, position assuming traders should start considering exiting. But till then, the market, the Nifty is a buy on dips as well as the Bank Nifty. Both sharp intraday dips should be bought into. All right. Uh, what about individual stocks, Sudarshan? What are we looking at today? Sure. We'll start with HDFC Bank, where a three-day consolidation could break on the upside. Buy with a stop under fifteen hundred. Bharti Airtel, another small dip in the uh, stock price. and the chart suggests a support level is holding buy with a stop under 1179 pvr inox had a big range breakout about 6 7 days ago and then it consolidated that's a normal process when a stock is breaking out a big breakout and a consolidation buy with a stop under 1322 and balkrishna industries had a 3 month range broke up broke out again with a handsome large bar it's consolidating buy that with a stop under 2315 Okay, uh, Sudarshan, thanks for that. Mitesh, what about you? I have all buy calls as well. Uh, ICICI Bank is the first name. Cheaper stop at thousand ninety five, eleven thirty five forty should be the trading target. Uh, buy on MCX with a stop below thirty six seventy five for target of thirty eight fifty. 
a buy on NMDC with a stop at 224 for targets of 237. Uh, sorry, one sell call, that's Indian Hotels. Keep a stop at 606, look for targets of 577. Yeah, I mean, I was uh, <coughs> <coughs> waiting for a metal name. NMDC is there. Uh, but uh, any any others, uh, Vedanta, Hindustan Zinc had a massive move yesterday. Uh, Vedanta is up uh, very sharply recently. Uh, from 270-ish levels to, I think, uh, what, 340 or uh, 360 now. Uh, Hindustan Copper is another one, which ended about 8 9% higher. Uh, you have uh, sort of trades running on uh, any of these? That's for me? Yeah, Midesh, for you. Yeah. So, I think, uh, you know, uh, I do like uh, uh, some of the names over here. Uh, we have positions in sale and uh, Tata Steel taken some profits out there. Uh, that apart, I think, you know, Hindustan Copper, I uh, kind of booked out. We have not been able to re-enter because of the strong rally which has happened over there. But the overall structure for most of these names remains solid. So, the idea is that, you know, wait for that pullback to happen whenever it happens and then try to get an entry point. Alright, let's take a quick break on that note. On the other side of the break, we'll come back with the pre-opening rates. We'll also have Deepak Kumar Gaur of Sham Metallics and Energy to put focus on their expansion into stainless steel flat products. Stay tuned. Well, let's get a quick grip on what's happening in the FNO market this morning. We have our guest joining in now, Rajesh Palvia, the Vice President, Technical and Derivative Research at Access Securities, is with us. Rajesh, hi, good morning, and thanks for joining in. Your view on the market, which is in very steady state, uh, do you expect more upsides, and what are the stocks to look at today? Uh, good morning, Sonia. Yeah, so we believe that you know this uh, momentum is likely to continue further, and we can see further more higher level from here onward, as uh, both the indices are looking promising. Put writers are shifting their base at higher level. 22,500, uh, 22,600 have attracted put uh, writing in the previous session also. So that clearly giving us confidence that you know this rally can extend further. Once we able to take out 22,750, possible rally can extend towards. Uh, 20 to 900, even 23,000 kind of level also in a on a you know positional basis for Nifty. Bank Nifty uh, managed to view breakout of its uh, previous call concentration area of 48,500. So now if we continues to hold above 48,500 for Bank Nifty, here also we can see uh, this really can extend and possible target on the higher side uh, we could see towards 49,300 to 49,500 in the continuation of uh, this up move. So both indices are looking promising. Buy on dip should be your strategy at this moment. For Bank Nifty, your stop loss should be placed at around 48,300 till these levels are intact. One should remain on the long side of trade. And for Nifty, uh, 22,500 is your stop loss to hold your long position. To play this up move, we are initiating here to buy a 22,600 call option, which was close at around 100 rupees. Uh, we are projecting target for this call option at around 160 to 170. Keep your stop loss uh, around 65 rupees. The stocks uh, where we are focusing, that is the first one is from uh, you know a metal space, that is uh, Vedanta. Very strong buying action is uh, taking place since last couple of uh, week. Uh, stock has shown long built-up setup. Uh, uh, stock managed to give breakout on monthly as well as on the weekly chart. Long consolidation breakout is uh, taken place in the Vedanta. So we expect uh, Vedanta can extend its rally. Uh, we are projecting target towards 355 to 360. Uh, keep your stop loss at around 330. Second stock that we like is Tata Power. A very strong uh, buying action is taking place. Stock now again managed to regain its all-time high trajectory. Uh, the looking at the near-term, short-term structure, we expect uh, Tata Power may extend its rally. 445 uh, to 450 could be the possible target we can see. Uh, so one can buy Tata Power with stop loss of 418. And the third stock that we like is uh, uh, Metropolis. Uh, if we lo uh, look at the uh, near-term, short-term structure, the stock managed to give breakout on the near-term chart and the kind of uh, buying action which we have uh, seen in the previous session that clearly shows that you know this stock can extend its really 1800 to 1820 could be the possible target. Metropolis is buy with stop loss of 1740. Uh, <clears throat> Rajesh, thanks very much. Those are individual uh, trades as well on the FNO side of things. But what's the momentumizer stock today? 
Reema is a rise on uh, Castrol. Reema, big move uh, yesterday. Big move yesterday and it happened in the second half of the trading session. Uh, so Castrol ended with a gain of close to about 7.6%. With that, the stock hit a fresh 52-week high. So just pull up that intraday chart. Volumes too were much higher. Volumes at 3 crore share versus a one-month average of 62 lakh which means volumes jumped up 5x and there was a big jump in delivery volumes too at 73 lakh. The stock also in the last uh, close to about two months has been trading in a band of 185 to 217. So yesterday with the up move, it's also broken out of that trading band. Also bear in mind that the, though the stock hit a fresh 52-week high, it's still 20% away from its lifetime high level. So did the breakout, <coughs> will the breakout that took place yesterday help the stock move on to its all-time high level of 272. And also just a word on the fundamentals, the company held an analyst meet in February. So it's been a while towards the end of February where they did talk about achieving growth higher than the industry growth, um, you know, rate of 4 to 6 percent in terms of volumes with margins at 22 to 26 percent. Okay, thanks a lot for that. Well, uh, the pre-opening session, uh, the pre-opening rates are kicking in right now. So just keep an eye out on them. A couple of stocks that you need to look at this morning. One of them is Vedanta, where CLSA has gone ahead and upgraded Vedanta to a buy from an underperform. And they've increased the target price on Vedanta to 390 from 260 earlier. So that's seeing a big move this morning, 2% there. And uh, TCS as well ahead of its earnings on Friday. The stock is in focus. The stock has not done much in the last one month. TCS is down almost 5%. Uh, so just keep an eye out on that, sluggish ahead of its earnings. And then you have Paytm, where Bofa Securities has resumed coverage on the stock with an underperform. They have a target price of 400 rupees on Paytm. So that stock is down about 6 tenths of a percent. But Sham Metallics is the other one that we are uh, looking at this morning. Well, uh, the company, the stock has surged almost 120% uh, in the last one year. The company has established a new plan to expand into stainless steel flat products. This will have a capacity of 0.3 million metric tons per annum. To discuss this and more, uh, we have Deepak Kumar Gaur, who is the Chief Operating Officer at Shah Metallics and Energy. Mr. Gaur, thanks a lot for joining in. Uh, you know, just uh, first to ask you about this uh, stainless steel market expansion that you're looking at. What was the rationale behind entering this space? Do you see a lot of demand over here? If yes, can you quantify it for us? And um, where do you think you can take this business to? What is the opportunity for you over the next couple of years? So basically, if we see the last few years, the demand in stainless steel has grown uh, by 5.2 5 CAGR. But in the years to come, we are expecting that it will go up to 6 to 7 percent between that. So uh, to meet the uh, demand, and we uh, we are going for this uh, 300,000 tons per annum capacity at Sambalpur plant, where we are having our this ore to metal facility, all raw material we are uh, we have availability of the raw material in house so basically we are catering the uh, demand this the surge in demand which is we are expecting in next uh, years to come are you uh, investing uh, for this 300000 uh, capacity uh, and at peak capacity uh, what will be uh, the kind of revenues that you will make from this what's the asset turn so basically, if we uh, if we uh, cumulative this all the plant that we already we are in stainless steel long product where uh, in Indore where we have acquired this metal uh, power. No, from the new yeah. one, sir. From the so, from what you're setting up now, yes. So I'm I, I'm coming on that. So there also yeah. we are adding facility for this uh, further uh, uh, further processing to uh, increase our EBITDA margin. So this uh, 25,000 ton uh, facility we are adding for bright parts and 18,000 ton per annum for this wires. So if we con if we consider all this, though we are expecting uh, 5,000 to 6,000 CR uh, on this stainless steel. From the incremental revenue will be 5,000 to 6,000 crore rupees. Yes. Crop. And this will accrue to you when? So basically, we are expecting that uh, this will uh, come into operation uh, in mid of 26-27. Although we okay. are expecting this bright bar and wire facility to come in 25-26. Uh, hmm. yes. Okay. And what will be the margins then in the middle of FI26? So uh, basically, margins, uh, uh, we can say that uh, once this uh, value addition stream start functioning, we will increase this uh, uh, supply chain material by EBITDA margin by 7,000 to around 7,000 ton per uh, per metric ton, uh, 7,000 rupees per metric ton. Additional mm. EBITDA margin we are expecting. 
Okay. Uh, you said 5,000 to 6,000 crores of incremental revenues from the stainless steel expansion. Uh, can you tell us what is the investment that you're making into this unit? What is the return on asset that you're looking at over the next one to two years? So, uh, we are we are uh, expecting this capital outlay of around 650 to 750 CR. Okay. For all this. So, okay. investment so, of 650 to 700 crores and from the invest from this investment, revenues of between 5,000 to 6,000 crores. Yes, please. Okay. Mm -hmm. Could you give us an overall sense? What will the overall company revenues look like in F526? See, I am basically fo focusing on stainless steel. So, for okay. cumulative figure, it, uh, it would be difficult to comment on that. <clears throat> Okay. Fair uh, I, uh, so I just had one question. You said uh, you know the, you talked about how much you'll be investing in this unit, but uh, for the raw materials for this proposed unit, how are you planning to secure that, and what is the kind of investment that you're looking at for that? So basically, for this uh, unit, what uh, we are talking about this 0.3 million ton. This raw material all we we have in house. We have this uh, okay. ferroalloys in house. We have uh, sponge iron pellet. So basically, the all the raw material, this capital raw material will be used. So based on that, we have planned this uh, 200 and 400 series, where this nickel requirement is uh, very less because nickel availability in India is very less. And all this is made in India and thus to align with this Atam Nirbhar Bharat. So all, uh, all the raw material will be now available because we are so we are ore to metal company. So we are uh, producing sponge iron, this pellet sponge iron. So that will be used. And from this raw material, we uh, from this uh, pellet DRI and this uh, uh, this in-house uh, parallelize that will be utilized to uh, produce stainless steel. All right. Okay. Uh, we leave it at that. So thanks a lot for joining in. Uh, appreciate uh, you know your time here on the channel. Well, let's uh, go across to Sudarshan Sukhani now. He's joining in to give us the big call at 9.10. Uh, the market, by the way, looks like it's going to open in the green. So the Nifty is up almost about 78 points. Big moves in the last couple of days. Can't deny that. 22,700 is here already. Remember, it's a big up move from the low that we hit uh, uh, around 15th of March, which was 21,800. So the market has covered so much ground in less than a month. But Sudarshan, what's the big call at 9.10? Well, consider buying Bharti Airtel with a stop under 11.79. Okay, and Mitesh, what about you? Well, you go with the buy on ICICI Bank for a short-term target of 11.35. Okay, thank you very much uh, for that. Keep your eye on telecom stocks also in uh, today's trading session. There have been quite a few brokerage notes. So let me start with, uh, you know, Antique on Bharti Airtel, where they've initiated coverage. It's a buy rating. Target price is at 1500 from the current market price of 1200 Antique is looking at a 25% upside. They believe Bharti Airtel is likely to ride its best financial performance phase in over a decade. This is driven by tariff hikes, upgradation of their 2G subscribers to 4G, 5G, strong growth in enterprises and fiber to home, and a fall in capex because their 5G capex is already done. So therefore, their return ratios will rise to 20% and also the cash flows will increase. Maybe the cash flows will be at historic levels, which will help in deleveraging their balance sheet. So according to Antique, this could be Bharti's best you know, balance sheet financial performance in over a decade. On Vodafone Idea, CLSA has written a note. They have a sell call. Uh, yesterday, we had the TREI you know, data out for the subscriber numbers. And they're saying that Vodafone Idea has seen a loss of 17 million subscribers in the last 12 months. And this is because of very low capex. The company's only spent 1,300 crore in terms of capex in nine months of FI24. The street is still awaiting the equity fundraise. Promoter infusion is done, but the external fundraise and the 5G rollout. But also remember, Vodafone Idea is now in an FNO ban, and that's happened after a long time. Inda Stars has also been, uh, you know, one of the big movers of this year. The stock is up 60% year to date. So Jeffrey says that after a sharp 60% rally on Inda Stars in year to date, the stock, uh, you know, at current valuations is capturing all the potential improvement in growth that it could witness if Vodafone Idea expands its networks. So they believe all the good news is already in the price. So they have an underperform rating on the stock with a target price of 250 much lower than the current market price of 325. All right. Uh, 
<coughs> uh, well, that's uh, idea and uh, Indus Tower, right? I mean, the play on Indus is based on idea getting better, uh, and uh, Indus itself has gone up 60%, as Reema pointed out. And uh, the call they're saying that, well, it kind of is now priced to perfection in that sense. Now, of course, the actual improvement in idea, the fundraise and everything, et cetera, at the idea level has to happen. I mean, that's, uh, well, that's what uh, markets will watch out for in um, FNO band as well. But uh, <clears throat> let's kind of uh, revisit some of the stocks uh, from earlier. Vedanta is one and uh, MCX is the other one. Sudarshan is back with us. Sudarshan, morning. Morning, Prashant. So first I'll talk about Vedanta. CLSA has upgraded the stock to buy from underperformance. Target is raised to 390 from rupees 260 per share. CLSA says company is well placed to benefit from commodity upcycle and efforts to raise capacity and profitability across segments augurs well. Leverage trajectory and corporate structure will be key to watch. Next is MCX. Motial Oswal has upgraded the stock to buy from neutral and target is raised to 4300 from rupees 3940 3, per share. It says new products will be the key growth drivers and average daily traded volume in option, option segment may rise by 60% in FY25. Analysis yields 7% rise in EPS for every rupees 10,000 crore additional ADTV in options and FY24-26 revenue, EBITDA, profit, CAGR, CNET 28%, 205% and 157% respectively. All right, uh, let's go across to Ekta now. She's tracking Alkim and Loop in Ekta, over to you. Thanks. I'll start with uh, Alchem. Nomura has written on it. They have a neutral rating with a target price of 5605. They've basically spoken about the observations which were issued to the Baddi unit. Uh, according to them, which are somewhat concerning, remember that uh, the plant was inspected and issued 10 observations in the month of March. They do not rule out a possibility of an official action indicated status. This particular plant contributes 8 to 10 percent of the FY24 consolidated sales. They've planned two to three launches from Baddi, which can be delayed now because of the classification possibly of OAI. Now, Lupin, the news is that they've launched the first generic version of Orkea generic, uh, which is basically doxycycline capsules, which is used to treat inflammatory lesions of Rosia which is a skin condition and sales are around $128 million. Nomura has a buy and a target price of $19.49. They think it's an... The launch follows a recent district court decision that upheld loop, that Lupin doesn't infringe two patents with regards to this drug. And uh, this US product launch... Uh, ...present an upside to the earnings estimates according to them. So this is a positive launch for Lupin, they won a court case recently, which allowed them to launch it. All right, uh, Ekta, thanks very much uh, for that. Uh, so, watch out for those farmers. Uh, in just about a minute or so, less than a minute or so, and the Sensex will start about uh, 270 points higher. That's essentially the indication from the pre open It's a strong start, but will we sustain through the course of the day, or uh, will they be like we saw yesterday? I mean, actually, the opening is pretty similar to where uh, at least on the indices, is pretty similar to what we had yesterday as well. Metals, that Vedanta call, but even without Vedanta, I mean, uh, that pack has been buzzing here. And went up sharply and many others. The market open coming up. The first rates uh, on your screen, 22,720, a uh, 50 point higher start than Nifty Bank as well. So this is pretty similar to what we had yesterday, by the way. We start off with the metal names because that's where all the action has been in the last couple of days. Vedanta, right? Uh, so CLSA has upgraded Vedanta to a buy from an underperform. Look, at Alchem Labs is in focus. Nomura came out with a note where they say that the observations and on, on Friday, ahead of that, the stock has been very lackluster. So the stock is down almost 4 That muted performance continues as we head into the earnings as well. Uh, Peti Antique has initiated coverage on Bharti with a 1500 rupee target price. That's and so just keep an eye out on Floti and e Gov. That stock is up almost about trending around that 1140 mark. But apart from that, the market is and uh, you know the Nifty Bank is not participating today. So let's see whether the metals are doing well yet again. I think the Nifty Metal Index is up close to one. So yet again, that's the best performing uh, index, and it's not just the names. Stata Steel and Hindalco with a rally of close to about one and a half percent outside of. And Vedanta, of course, posted CLSA upgrade has gained nearly four percent. Uh, so metals are ruling the roost. Reliance Industries, which was a drag yesterday, Reliance Industries has bounced back, and that's a stock which is up nearly one percent. Um, on the way back, on the way down, Devi's Laboratory is subdued. That's the top Nifty loser, one and a quarter percent gone on that. HDFC Bank. Uh, it underperformed the rest of the private sector financials yesterday and today also HDFC Bank is under pressure. 
The cut is not huge. It's down close to about half a percent. So that's the large cap action. Uh, in the mid cap uh, universe, you've got Sterling Tech reversing some of yesterday's 13% up move post the QIP announcement. Vodafone Idea is weak. Inda Stars too uh, retreats a bit uh, after 60% rally on a year-to-date basis. XI2 has cooled off. Um, and on the way up, you've got a Pesa Low Digital, 5% up on that, and GMDC, BHEL, Zomato. Yeah, no, absolutely. You look at Policy Bazaar, uh, you know, there's PV Fintech. News came yesterday in, uh, towards closing uh, the last hour, uh, and we put that out, by the way. Uh, so, ICSA Lombard, the largest general insurer, which was not available on the PV Fintech platform, is now part of the PV Fintech platform. It'll be available on the PV Fintech. You can buy all those policies uh, on the platform. Uh, so, PB Fintech is seeing a large 5% move. It's the largest volume. It is one of the largest, not the largest, but the, one of the largest volume-led gainers this morning coming through. Look at Indigo, right? Uh, you know, Indigo, of course, is, I think, pretty much at a new high. Affairs are going up. Uh, there is a player in the market which, of course, has, has had recent troubles. I'm talking about Vistara. Uh, and, of course, Indigo is going in and add, adding capacity <clears throat> as well. Uh, so, just a few other names. Sham Metallic, we just had the company with us, 4.5% higher there, 647. Uh, that sort of, uh, you know, expansion in the stainless, on the stainless steel side, entry in the stainless steel flat product side, uh, really. HEG is up about 1.5%. Colte Patel is up 4% this morning. There is Sona Comstar, which is up about 3% or so. So, it's a, you know, pretty vibrant screen. <laughs> Two is to one in favor of advances to declines uh, is what we have. I think Rima did mention Indus Tower, right? Indus mm. Tower is down too, and there's a call there as well. IRB, we'll be speaking with the management. IRB is down 4% this morning, and it's got volumes as well. And IIFL, which had rallied about 25% last three or four days, uh, that's pulling back just a little bit, two and a quarter percent or so uh, this morning. So, so you know, on Kolte Patel, right, you mentioned yeah. uh, Motilal Oswal has actually initiated coverage on that stock. Uh, they say that the growth potential is now getting unlocked. Mm. And they have a target price of 700, which is uh, almost a 35% upside to the current market price. Yeah. Now, the big thing that they talk about is not only is the performance picking up quite a bit because Kolte Patel is increasing their presence now in the Mumbai metropolitan region, the MMR region and the Bengaluru market, which are high growth areas. But there's also a very healthy balance sheet that Kolte Patel is sitting on. And that's the reason for which they are very bullish on the stock. Stock is up almost 3.5% today. But if you look at, you know, the last seven days, the stock is up almost about 12 odd percent. So, uh, I mean, real estate continues to be the flavor of the moment now. <clears throat> no, absolutely. And uh, that's that's absolutely right. Uh, so, you know, yesterday, of course, Goddard's property saw a big move. We should actually look at Goddard's properties as well and uh, see what's happening there. Uh, but, uh, <clears throat> you know, so many other names are uh, starting to participate as well. Market, uh, you know, breadth is, of course, positive, but it's too early. Uh, it was two is to one, but it's slipping. A thousand and fifty stocks are higher, and you got about nine hundred stocks which are lower. So, you know the <coughs> uh, what started as a very strong one-way kind of a, a move is uh, moderating a little bit uh, at this point in uh, time. Uh, Vedanta was at about three fifty-five. It's come off to about three fifty-one. Uh, BHEL is another one into the mix, right? Which is uh, it's up uh, at, at, at about two sixty-two percent higher. GMDC is another one. Look at GMDC, which is up about 4% or so. Uh, very large volumes. BEML is another one. We had a defense company with us in the morning, Paris Defense. But of course, these are the larger ones. BEML is up about 2% or so uh, as, as well. So, <clears throat> you know, lots happening. Well, uh, we'll uh, come back to more names in a bit. The Nifty is up about 50 points, so can't complain. Gautam Dugar is with us, Head of Research Institutional Equities at Motor Losal Financial Services. Gautam, good morning. Good to have you with us here. Thank you very much for your time. You know... We are, of course, at the cusp of another earnings season. And I was reading the story on, uh, it was a money control story and that kind of aggregated earnings expectations from, I mean, you guys, Motilala, and a bunch of others as well. And what they're pointing out too is that earnings growth expectations for this quarter are uh, perhaps, uh, you know, one of the lowest that we've had over the last one year or so. Uh, we've kind of seen some earnings cuts, etc., going into the earnings season as well. Just wanted to, I wanted you to contextualize that. Is that, are we starting to see a deceleration in earnings growth or is it something else? Go on, Kadam. Hi, hi, Prashant. Good morning. Uh, so, two different uh, points there. First of all, uh, you have to look at the context of what happened in the first nine months. The first nine months earnings growth in Nifty was 26%. And uh, we had expected a sub-10% kind of a growth in fourth quarter. 
because we had done the four quarter uh, split right at the beginning of April as we always do last year. So this quarter 6% growth therefore looks a bit softer. But uh, you have to uh, look at the nuances behind that. Number one, uh, it's being dragged down by commodities, which is metals and oil and gas. So for my coverage, if you remove these two sectors, the growth is about 12%, right? If you look at the similar number for Nifty without commodities, the growth is about 19%. So yes, versus the first nine months, it looks a bit soft. But also remember that for the full year, you are ending at 21% earnings growth, uh, EPS growth for Nifty. Next year, we are expecting about 14-15% kind of an earnings growth number. So there's 980 rupees of EPS that we are building in for FY24, uh, which has been pretty stable, by the way. There's been no cut for the last 7-8 months now. We were around similar 974 number in October 23, and now we are at 980 rupees. So broadly stable for FY24. FY25, we are down from 1130 to somewhere close to 1120. So marginal 1% cut. Now, if you do 14, 15% growth even next year, then this will be the first time after a long, long time that for five years in a row, you're talking about a double digit earnings growth. Because last four years, between FY20 to FY24, Nifty earnings have already compounded at 22%, from 3.4 odd lakh crores to somewhere about 7.8 lakh crores. And if you look at a broader market and you know look at our coverage universe of 270 stocks, we are talking about a compounding of 27% between FY20 to 24, right? From about 4.3 lakh crores to about 11 lakh crores this year. And our expectations for next two years for our coverage universe, the broader universe, is about 16% compounding for next two years, from 11 lakh crores to somewhere close to 15 lakh crores. I would say, uh, uh, you know, quarterly fluctuations aside, earnings momentum for corporate India is very solid. And like we have mentioned in our report, it almost feels like a mini Goldilocks because macros are fine, earnings growth is fine. So yes, this quarter is a bit soft because of commodity, but otherwise the trend is quite intact. Okay. Gautam, hi, good morning and thanks for joining in. I have to ask you your view on uh, what's happening with the rise in gold prices, right? I mean, in so many years of tracking the markets, I've never seen a time where gold is rising like this at a time when equities is also surging. But it also speaks about how the power play is perhaps seeing a tectonic shift away from the west to the east with China buying so much gold to hedge against the dollar. What does all of this mean for an equity market investor? So, Sonia, uh, it's futile to predict, uh, you know, the commodity prices. Uh, this is one thing I've learned in the last 17 years being in markets. You know, whether it's gold, crude oil, uh, metals, you just cannot predict it. Yes, it is a bit, uh, you know, uh, uh, unprecedented that you are seeing equity markets at a new high. Gold prices are doing well. At the same time, the 10-year yields of US have brought a reason also. And there is a potential discussion on rate cuts timing. So, uh, not everything adds up, right? So, at some point of time, something has to give away. Now, uh, you know, a job of an investor, uh, you know, especially equity market investor, is to look at investable ideas in investable sectors. You know, you can discuss, uh, you know, where the gold prices are going or where the crude oil prices are going, but the probability of you getting that right is next to zero. Uh, from, no, my uh, question, Gautam, uh, my question is more to do with asset allocation, right? A lot of people are having okay. this uh, missed out feeling. Uh, left out feeling in this gold rush. So what is your advice to them? Does it make sense to still buy at these levels or just you know stick to plain old equities? Because a lot of the buying that you're seeing in gold could also be speculative. So Sonia, all I can say is one should have a very uh, diversified asset allocation based on one's risk profile. Uh, you know, my uh, unfortunately, my expertise on uh, gold is very limited. Yes, we do like uh, some of the plays on the gold uh, in the listed equity space which is where we have a very bullish view for last 10, 12 years, part of a model portfolio too. But from an individual's asset allocation perspective, obviously he or she should have some gold in their portfolio. But beyond that, it's going to be very difficult for an equity market guy to comment on that. Mm. Uh, Gautam, morning. Uh, Rima here. This um, entire recovery or the continuation of strong earnings growth is also predicated that consumption picks up at some point of time, right? Uh, is that a big risk because consumption has been lagging, rural has not picked up as of now. Um, when, do you, when do you expect consumption to pick up and will that be a big risk to monitor? And also a little more on commodities because commodity prices have started going up. So two things, Rima. First of all, next year's growth is not predicated on consumption picking up. 
if I give you the numbers, next year's 16% growth, roughly 50 to 65% of, or rather two thirds of the incremental earnings are coming from three sectors, which is uh, financials, uh, metals, uh, and metals are obviously rebounding from the low base. So it's a bit of an optical uh, element coming into play. And then you have some recovery built in IT, right? So consumption per se, we are not expecting any big up move, at least in staple companies' earnings. In fact, our own uh, estimate for staple earnings next year is somewhere about 8 to 10% earnings growth, uh, which is uh, way lower than what we are building in for the index. When does consumption revive? Uh, there are two aspects to look at it. Uh, consumption is a very broad ocean and there are multiple sub-segments. Some of them are doing exceedingly well, things like hotels, uh, things like uh, discretionary names and jewelry and all. They're doing phenomenally well. What is lagging, however, is the low ticket consumption item, right? Which is staples, you know, the uh, you know home and personal care and things like that. Now for that to recover, there, there is a requirement of two, three things to happen. Number one, the monsoon needs to be normal, uh, which is a good thing because there's a prediction that this year's monsoon is going to be normal. Point number two, inflation needs to come down, which is also happening, by the way. So inflation prints are coming off. And third, uh, this is a hope that the political spending uh, in the forthcoming elections, which at some point of time with a lag of six, seven months, will uh, propel consumption at the bottom of the pyramid. So if I remember well, 2019 general elections, the total political spending uh, as per various estimates was about 60,000 crores. It's fair to say that this year should be closer to a lakh crore. Now, that kind of money trickling down uh, will obviously take some time before it reflects in the numbers of consumption companies. But that's a hope uh, because this stocks, this uh, volume growth, top line growth have been lagging not just for the last two, three years. Uh, you know, if you look at the last 10 years data of consumer staple companies also, hardly one or two consumer staple companies have been able to compound their top lines at 10%. Most others have compounded at 6 7%. Top line growth, I'm not even talking about earnings. So top line has been very, very lackluster for almost a decade now. So that's a hope. But from our point of view, we are still very, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, as far as our model portfolio is concerned, we are completely positioned towards discretionary consumption. So out of the nine stocks that we hold in model portfolio, eight are discretionary in nature. There's just one consumer state to come. Uh, <clears throat> Gautam, uh, you know, just to come back to metals, right? Not asking you to predict prices, <laughs> impossible to do. Uh, and of course, I mean, the old adage, right? Metals are best bought uh, or sold at extremes. Actually, uh, on the selling side, tough to say when it's at an extreme, but uh, easier on the downside. Uh, now, of course, they're not at the uh, lower end in terms of valuations or anything. But just, and, and I know that I think Hind, uh, Hindalco is part of your model portfolio, but I wanted your thoughts on Vedanta uh, here. It's uh, actually two names, Vedanta and Hindustan Copper, if you have. I'm sure you've looked at the, uh, looked at the business uh, Vedanta, of course, is a play on a variety of commodities, uh, but also it was going through, it's been going through a fair bit of turbulent phase. Hope, of course, always has been that they're able to sort those issues out. Uh, so it'll be able to, and then it'll be able to realize its full value. Just your thoughts, Gautam. So, Prashant, unfortunately, I would be able to comment on individual stocks now as per the revised disclosure norms. Uh, uh, any which way is Hindustan Copper, we don't have a coverage. But to make a broader point on metal space, just remember, Prashant, that when we are talking about next year's earnings growth of 35%, you know, uh, our numbers for nifty metal companies, including Coal India, the profit number is somewhere close to 72,000 crores. You know, this year they will do 53,000 crores. But do remember that this 72,000 crores, if it is achieved in FY25, it will still be 30% lower than what the metal profits were in FY22 when they hit 92, 93,000 crores. So there is some element of, as I said, optical illusion built into it. And there is also a fond hope that the global economy will show some recovery, especially China. You know, because when you talk about metals, obviously the big elephant in the room is always China. So that is our uh, expectation that there will be some recovery in metals uh, profitability. And which is why we've raised allocation on metals in our model portfolio from being underweight for last almost nine months to now being neutral. Okay, all right. Uh, by the way, I think uh, you have uh, a lemon tree, which is part of your uh, model portfolio as well, right, Gautam? So you may want to hang on and uh, listen to the next conversation, uh, which is coming up, which is, of course, the lemon tree uh, conversation. The management, I think, is uh, with us and he's ready uh, to, uh, so we can go across to him. Uh, so, we've, of course, uh, cross the 10,000 room mark. Uh, it's also launched the first property in Nepal to discuss some of this and, of course, their expansion plans beyond India. 
Uh, we have Mr. Patanjali Keswani, Chairman and Managing Director at Lemon Tree Hotels. Mr. Keswani, good morning. Good to have you with us here. Thanks very much. Things have been going great. So every time we get you on, the first question all, always is, uh, uh, do things continue to remain as great? Or is, uh, have you noticed any downshift or you know, even you know, upshift, if it's possible, uh, in that sense? I'm talking about occupancies and uh, average room rates. Well, <clears throat> the good news is there is no downshift. <clears throat> but, uh, you know, we have now entered H1, which is typically the, the low season for the hotel industry. Uh, and when I can compare it to the previous year, I don't see anything which is uh, less than last year. There is, I think, a slight pickup in demand. Uh, but overall, as I, I think I've said earlier, there is, I think, uh, going to be a structural shift in demand in India for branded hotel rooms. And elements of that, I think, we already see playing out. And this will continue for the next three to five years, in my opinion. Hmm. That's interesting. So, uh, Mr. Keswani, hi, good morning. Uh, can you tell us a little more about what this structural shift in demand could be? Uh, how is the demand supply situation right now? Because a lot of segments, say uh, weddings, for example, right? Uh, Prime Minister Modi has indicated that a lot of the weddings now need to happen in India versus happening abroad earlier. So, that would, of course, give rise to further demand. So, I'm just trying to understand when you talk about a structural change in demand in the industry, what are you trying to, you know, what are you getting at? Good morning, Zonia. Well, I think what I'm trying to say is that it has been, uh, you know, it, typically in our business, we look back and look at the trends and then try and project the future, which is some form of forecasting. So what we are really saying is we know how much supply is coming out in the next, say, three to five years. We know the trend lines of demand growth based on various parameters, and then we try and project what the likely occupancy and therefore price will be. But when I say structural, what I'm fundamentally saying, and this is not only true for hotels, I think this is true for the overall consumer discretionary uh, story in India. It is that, uh, you know, in the past, about 60% of our personal consumption expenditure was always going towards staples. Uh, but when you go forward and, uh, you know, as the economy grows, that percentage will keep reducing because there is, you know, uh, you consume staples and that's that. Beyond that, as your income grows, and there are increasing mm -hmm. cohorts of Indian uh, Indian consumers who are now moving into a position where every year with the growth of, say, 6, 7, 8% in the Indian GDP, there will be maybe 8 to 10% of Indians who move into an inflection point where their incomes are such that they spend much more on what earlier was discretionary for them. So they start basically moving from discretionary to non-discretionary. And that is what I talk about. So that is no longer looking back and saying every year this sector, this segment grew at 5% or 10%. This is a hockey stick growth because you have a very large number of Indians who will suddenly start, for example, uh, you know, traveling in SUVs on four-lane highways within four hours of uh, urban centers in India and going on holidays. I mean, this is just a, a, an example. So that is basically what I'm trying to say. And that typically happens in a country's economy when the GDP per capita, you know, moves from $2,500 to $3,000 per capita. Got it. So when you talk about a structural uptrend, when you talk about a structural uptrend, you're talking more about consumer preferences also changing and now India moving from, say, a low income to a middle income economy. So, you know, uh, spending more on discretionary things. Got that. Absolutely. But how are you going to how are you going to capitalize on all of this? So if you can tell us a little more about your expansion plans, what is the hotel opening a pipeline for FY25 and over the next, uh, say, couple of years? So broadly, we, I reckon that we will open about 2,000, 2,500 rooms this financial year. And we will add or sign, put in our pipeline another, maybe 3,000 rooms. So overall, the inventory will grow 20, 25%. And the pipeline will grow by about 3,000 rooms, which is about 30%. So basically, our intention is every year, we add more rooms to our pipeline then the number of rooms we open. Uh, does uh, the political calendar or the IPL boost demand just in the near term? <laughs> yes. Uh, in some cities, it boosts demand wherever uh, events like this happen. And as far as uh, uh, the elections go, 
obviously there is more travel but uh, <laughs> conversely also less demand in some ways so uh, i think it balances out there will be no perceptible improvement in demand due to elections or ipl in q1 uh, no that's not structural that is event based but yes event I based but just in the near term yeah so there will be some improvement but in some cases because of you know all these rallies and so on and so forth people will also not want to travel to a city so i think on on the balance it evens out uh, orica in mumbai what's been the occupancy well that is uh, i'm in a blackout period so i don't want to okay. comment on the occupancy but overall i can say it is in line with what uh, guidance i have given uh, that the demand is, uh, is is quite good mm, absolutely uh <clears throat> uh, Mr. Keswani, if I can request you to take a question from uh, Gautam Dugar, who's been listening by. He's head of research at Motilal Oswal, tracks the company, and uh, you know, your stock is part of the model portfolio. I'm sure you know him well. Gautam, go ahead. Thanks, Vishal. Just wanted to understand, Mr. Keswani. Good morning. Uh, good morning. Do you see the cycle extending? I don't want to basically ask about specifics of the company, but you know, hotels as a sector has done exceedingly well post COVID, right? Uh, whether you or your peers. And and we are seeing some of the subsectors in consumption, something like a real estate or other discretionary consumption sectors. The cycle is prolonging this time, you know. And and uh, this has not happened in the past, you know. Margins have gone up, occupancies have gone up, and demand is outpacing the supply CHR. How long do you think this can last? Is it a two year, one year? You know, just just some perspective on that would be very helpful. So uh, good morning, Rath. You know, typically, uh, we do look at uh, the hotel industry, all of us, as a cyclical business. And therefore, we say, how much is demand growth? And, you know, looking back, what was normal demand growth linked to a certain rate of growth of economy? What is the supply growth, which is known because it takes a few years to build a hotel? And then we try and project occupancies. But the broad point I'm trying to make is that if you look 15 years ago or 16 years ago to say Indonesia and a year or two before that to China and then go back to other countries that were roughly at this point of GDP per capita as, as, as is in India, there is a magic number. The magic number was $7,000 per uh, capita, which means roughly $30,000, $35,000 per household. At that point, there was a huge change in demand for branded hotel rooms. And if I look at China or Indonesia, say 2006 to 2013, the annual rate of growth of demand for uh, branded hotel rooms was CAGRing at over 22, if I remember right, 22 percent, as opposed to earlier years when it was less than half of that. Broadly, this is when, uh, and I'm sure you, you understand this, uh, you know, uh, very well, that there was a very large number of consumers who suddenly started consuming branded hotels. Mm. And therefore, the looking back of trend lines and linking it to uh, 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 growth per person and GDP and so on was no longer valid. So it was like a hockey stick for that, that five-year period. And then again, it stabilized and started growing at 7, 8, 10 percent a year. So what I, I, I am trying to say really is that we are on that runway. Now, whether it happens, you know, in one, two or three years, I cannot say. But I am 100 percent sure it will happen in the next four, four years. Okay. Uh, it's interesting that we're having this discussion because uh, the other thing that is, uh, you know, India is benefiting from, Mr. Keswani, and I'm sure Gautam, you would agree as well, is this huge demographic dividend that we're sitting on, right? I mean, India has about, what, 600 million people who are in the age group of 18 to 35, and I think one of the youngest population in the world. So, and at a time when now the younger generation prefers to spend on experiences rather than things, Mr. Keswani, do you think that is an added incentive? Is that something that you guys have already priced into your, uh, say, average room rate predictions, for, for example? I mean, do you think that there could be a disproportionate rise in some of these metrics purely because of the demographic dividend? So, it's a very interesting point you're raising, Sonia. So, let me just give you, for the hotel sector or the tourism sector, what I would call four high-frequency indicators of demand growth. One is 
the number of runways in India. So right now we have, a, I think, roughly 150 airports with a certain number of runways. Uh, I believe this 150 is going to go to 250 in the next four to five years. That is what the government has announced. Uh, number two is that the number of seats or airplane seats in India is poised to grow from current to two and a half to three times this in the next four years. The number of four-lane highways in India have grown 3x in the last four years and is continuing to grow at that rate. The rate of growth of demand for SUVs today, that's a magic point, by the way, is already 50% of total demand for passenger cars. So when you look at all these, what does it tell you? It tells you that there will be far more growth in travel, both by car and by air. Number two, you link that to the fact that, as you mentioned, demographic dividend, the new younger Indian is far more aspirational, driven by credit. So my guess is that one big sector that will grow enormously in the next five years will be uh, the industry that provides credit to young Indians with good credit management because they spend today and pay later. They are aspirational. They are brand driven. They are experiential. They are typically under 30, 35. We see that in our own hotels. So you just put all these, try and connect all these dots. And the broad point, uh, which I think we have all kind of agreed on, is that there will be no longer 6, 7, 8% growth in demand. But for maybe the next five years, starting maybe this year or next year, that demand growth will structurally shift towards, say, 15, 20% a year. Oh, for a couple of years in that too. Uh, Mr. Kiswani, uh, fantastic conversation, sir. So interesting when you sometimes pull back uh, from the quarter on quarter numbers and look at the bigger picture, uh, you get, uh, and, and very good data points on, you know, the airports and uh, okay, the capacity, which essentially is going to come up over the next couple of years as well. Thank you for joining us and good luck. I hope to speak with you after the first, after the fourth quarter numbers. Gautam, if you're there, thank you very much for uh, asking that question and staying on uh, as well. Thanks indeed. We'll take a quick commercial break here. We'll come back and uh, we have the management of IRB infrastructure. We discuss uh, the news this morning, uh, of course, apart from the business updates uh, as uh, they've come through. Stay with us. We'll also, after that, be joined by Devina Mehra, First Global, and we discuss all things markets, macros. Uh, so that's going to be an interesting one as well. Uh, stay with us. Well, IRB Infrastructure is the next management on the show. The company's toll collections rose 30% to almost 481 crores in March. Also, in the IRBAV uh, tollway versus the NHAI case, the arbitral tribunal has ruled against the company. To discuss more on this, we have Tushar Kavadia, 
Mahmoud the group CFO of IRB Infrastructure who joins us now to talk about that. Uh, Tushar, thanks a lot for joining us. Uh, first, I want to ask you a little bit about the toll collection, right? Can you give us an update on that? Year on year, what is the growth that we're looking at in FY25? What's your prediction? And also, there are some reports on toll stoppages because of some unrest. Have any of your collections been impacted because of this? If yes, what's the update there? Yeah, sure. Thank you. And good morning to all. So if you see uh, our performance for FY24 on the toll collections, where we have seen a good robust growth month on month, and the year by ended with almost 24% uh, annual growth from a group perspective, which includes the private invest asset as well. And for the month of March, it was almost 30% growth on a YOY basis. Looking to this performance and uh, adding of the new assets, which we, uh, which uh, which are from the NHI side, that is TOT 12 and 13, which commence its operations from uh, the April 1, uh, these two assets will start contributing to the toll collections in the next year. And uh, looking to the past performance on the toll collection, we expect a, a good robust growth for the FY25 as well. And uh, as such, we we have uh, we have seen that the GDP expected for next year is around seven percent. So, which leads to a traffic growth for us, and corresponding, there will be a tariff hike with link to inflation, which we expect around four four to four and a half percent. So, considering both the parameters, the growth is expected around ten to eleven percent of the uh, uh, for the next year uh, FY twenty five. Now, coming to the obstacles, we have not seen any obstacles in our collections. The collections are going fine across all projects. Uh, there is no hindrance on the toll collections and the, they are operating very smoothly. One thing I want to update on our performance for the last year that this uh, whole year FY24 was uh, remarkable for us, considering be it uh, toll collections, be it uh, acquisition of new assets, we were able to acquire a couple of TOT assets. Uh, which, which bring us to the largest TOT share in the country with 37%. We have, uh, Tushar, uh, uh, we'll, we'll get to individually uh, each of these in just a bit from now. Uh, a good yeah. morning, Prashant here. Uh, yeah. a, a great performance, really. Could you, uh, uh, but if I can sort of ask you to uh, comment on this, uh, uh, you know, the uh, long pending case in terms of the traffic diversion at AV tollway. Uh, yeah. Is that a bit of a setback? Can you uh, sort of contextualize that for us? Yeah, sure. So if you see, we have got the arbitral award uh, yesterday only, and uh, we were also being sat in with the award. So looking to the uh, award, if you see, the, our claim was with respect to the competing facility uh, to the particular stretch, and which was uh, the claim was filed for the from the year 2015-16, when we when we uh, uh, when we have seen the uh, this competing facility has come up uh, uh, parallel to our uh, uh, stretch. Now, the, uh, if you see the arbitral award, the award has already cons has considered this competing facility, uh, but the the year which they have considered is 2019 instead of 2015. So, looking to our claim, which was relating to 2015-16, the timelines is something which is now the basis of contention in the uh, court of law, where the claim is already being. Uh, have what was the si uh, Tushar? What was the size of the uh, uh, what was the amount under dispute? So, so amount of dispute. When we say that amount of dispute was due to the competing facility, say around uh, with from 25 uh, 2015 16, it was close to thousand crores. But it is a continuous claim which will exist for every year because this facility is already treated as a competing facility even by the arbitrate, arbitral tribunal. Now, no, so now, this is, sorry, this is, you said 1,000 crores or 2,000 crores, I missed that uh, number. No, no, 1,032 crores, which was since 2015-16, which was filed in the, uh, as a claim in our, uh, in the arbitration uh, claim itself, and uh, which, uh, which was for a particular period. Now, this is a continuous claim, which will be for a year-on-year -year basis, uh, and looking to the order as such, the arbitral tribunal has already agreed that there is a competing facility, but due to technical uh, technical uh, difficulties, since the uh, compensation uh, formula was compensation documents were not available, uh, the computation document were not available. The award was uh, without considering denied. that and uh, denied, and this leads us to a strong uh, strong case, a prima facie strong case to challenge in the higher. In the high court, 
where we will put forward our uh, case uh, basis our computations for the uh, claim uh, considering this as a competing facility so you will be filing a counter claim in the higher courts and you're hopeful that you will be granted that compensation of 1032 crore what's yeah, the timeline so, for that so again we have the legal remedy available uh, with all the advice of our legal counsel we will take this forward and uh, we will uh, in due course we will be taking this uh, in, in, in the courts as well uh, what is your uh, current order book? We have the update as of December 31st, uh, you know, moving on to business now, 36,200 approximately. What does the number stand at? And what is now the executable order book over the next two years? So if you see our order book with addition of uh, this new TOT stands at 36,000 crores and the executable order books for next one and a half, two years is around 10,000 crores, which includes an EPC order book of 7,000 crores and balance towards the ONM order book of the projects under the operations. And your L1 orders? What does uh, that stand at? Uh, so we we are just waiting uh, there is a good pipeline from nha available on the the bot space we where we, we where we have a lot of expertise and we are the largest in that particular space there are there is an ample opportunity coming from nha side uh, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, 2 trillion of assets worth of assets is expected to come for bidding in next one and a half two years and we we, we are quite confident to get a couple of them uh, with the added advantage of having partners like uh, DIC and Sintra uh, 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 with, and, and also the healthy balance sheet what we have today after uh, after deleveraging mm -hmm. ourselves. So that leads us a more competitive age uh, compared to others and uh, we will be more benefited with this strong balance sheet going forward for new biddings as well. But Tushar, the awarding by the NHA has been a bit muted, right? In FY24 at least. Uh, how much has it been so far? And um, what is the BOT projects that will be coming up for bidding? So as of now, if you see, uh, due to the code of conduct, the, the bidding uh, was slightly slowed down. But if you see, they have already uh, shortly listed the assets which are going to come for bidding. Uh, we expect in few months, uh, the, these assets will come up for bidding. Uh, out of this 2 trillion, we have seen 30,000 worth of assets are already had come for bidding and the, the balance will come in a phased manner, which we believe should be there in one and a half, two years of time. Okay. All right. We will leave it at that. Uh, thanks yeah. a lot for well, joining in. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. yeah with respect to the claim, I, I uh, the arbitration claim, I just want to point out one more thing that mm -hmm. the project is doing good and it has shown almost 12% uh, kind of revenue growth in last uh, two to three years. And considering that aspect uh, going forward, uh, we should be comfortably meeting the our uh, debt, obliga uh, debt obligation. In fact, the premium obligation in the balance concession period, uh, which is expected around 20 years from now. And mm. if at all, if you see the valuation of this particular asset in our whole valuation of IRB, it's quite minuscule and non-significant because uh, what we have seen, the, uh, the analysts uh, are just giving a, a weightage of around minus one to uh, rupees three for this particular asset and without factoring any arbitration award in this case. So as such, we don't see any uh, impact of this uh, order as such on our valuation. Just one quick question. Can you take us through the entire process of the secondary stake sale that happened in the private invit? How were the valuations arrived at and what does the entry of Ferrovial mean for invit prospects? Does funding become easier will, and will you look to aggressively target more? Yeah, so if you see the confidence of our investors, which include the strategic investor like Sintra that continued and we have seen this deal happening at the private invit level where they are acquiring the stake from GIC of 24% and uh, with the valuation what they are paying as a price is 67 billion for the acquisition of 24%. What we have seen the valuation uh, just doing the maths, it's like uh, uh, for the 10 assets which were part of, uh, which were operational. Uh, it's all, it was almost two and a half times to the book. And uh, with that kind of uh, valuation or the fair deal, we see that the total valuation considering all assets uh, would be somewhere around 400 to 480 billion. And uh, uh, looking to that size of uh, valuation 
uh, where IRB owns 51 percent, it gives a, 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 a fair value for the IRB stake as well. So this platform itself has been valued by the strategic investor and they want to participate uh, in the growth platform uh, where we the value was created since the time it has been uh, created its, uh, last three, four years back. Hmm. All right, uh, we leave it at that. Thanks a lot for joining in uh, and all the best. That's IRB Infra. By the way, the market is picking up pace. Not so much the headline index, but I think there's a lot of action in the mid-cap end of trade. The mid-cap index is now up almost 300 points and it just goes to show that this is such a momentum-driven market. There's so much money that has been flowing in from the domestic fraternity. Now, FIs have started to participate as well and the going is only getting better. In fact, Devina Mehra is joining in. She's the founder, chairperson and MD at First Global uh, and she's joining in to discuss her view on the market. Devina, always great speaking to you and, um, uh, you know, good to know that you are in Mumbai. You're in Mumbai right now, right? I'm in India. Okay, you're in India. So good to see that and uh, hope you have a good stay here. But you know, it's been a great run for this market, not just Indian markets, global markets are doing well, commodities like gold are doing well. Uh, how are you feeling about, uh, you know, the global market situation right now? And what's the best way to approach it for the rest of the calendar year? Uh, so I am quite positive on the global market, especially the equity side. Uh, so that remains, uh, uh, that has been my stance for a while. And uh, besides, you know, everybody only looks at US, so that obviously looks fine. And uh, But uh, the good thing has been that unlike uh, 2023, where for the first uh, 10 months, uh, there was only one thing which moved, which was the seven mega tech stocks. And that was actually a worrisome time because uh, the S&P move, let alone the NASDAQ, 90% of it was just seven stocks. Uh, but from November onwards, that has broadened quite a lot, and which which uh, which which is a good thing. And and some of those uh, magnificent seven, as they are called, have fallen uh, behind uh, Tesla. I was reading uh, just a couple of days back uh, that it was the worst performing. It has been the worst performing stock so far uh, in the S and P this year. Of course, it rallied a bit since then, but. Uh, so, so, as I always say, the themes change, the leadership changes, but there are, there are always opportunities. And uh, one market which we have been overweight on uh, from, uh, I think, about a year ago has been uh, Japan. Uh, India also in our global funds, we are somewhat overweight. Uh, China, we've been waiting for a bottoming out, but that bottoming out hasn't happened yet. Uh, so, yeah, there are a lot of things where you can, uh, there are a lot of opportunities. And equity markets in general uh, look fine. From a medium-term perspective. Mm. Uh, Sadevina, so uh, China has not bottomed out. What will be the markers to assess when China bottoms out? And what is your own view on that market? When will it bottom out? Uh, that is difficult. I mean, have, as I said, we've been watching. We've been watching actually the last six months. That it's uh, just as we were watching uh, Japan beginning of last year for a, a signal, and that signal came around April, and we went overweight, but. Uh, China has been among the major markets, the most beaten down one. And people try to kind of correlate things with the economy and say that what happens in China and uh, therefore what will happen uh, in, in terms of economy, economic terms and therefore what would happen in the market. But it's not so simple. Uh, the very fact that the Chinese market uh, made a high in 2007 and since then the Chinese economy is up seven times and the market has not taken out its high, it shows you how uh, far the disconnect can go. So you have to uh, watch the market uh, indicators rather than uh, what is happening in the economy. Devina, mm. hi, morning. Uh, uh, Prashant here. Now, uh, where does one get to make money? I know that in the near term, your view is a bit cautious, next one to three months, right? Uh, so one got to protect downsides as well. Uh, but uh, what about commodities? Uh, suddenly there's a fair bit of excitement. You know, that old thesis of a big super cycle and uh, metals like copper is, uh, is, ma is making a comeback. Uh, it, it's a thesis, but we'll see where it goes. Uh, oil prices, uh, you know, 90-ish uh, uh, sort of hovering there. And other commodities have also been doing well. Uh, is that the space where you think one can uh, sort of make incremental uh, money from here? Uh, w w just, just talk to us about that, Devina. Yeah, so in our uh, rebalance, which we carried out just now in the last few days, because we rebalance every quarter, we've added a couple of metal names since you spoke of commodities. But I mean, I am not into these grand narratives of super cycles and so on. 
because the narratives always uh, follow what is happening in the market and you know, commodities uh, upticks often don't last very, very long because uh, that is not beneficial for the majority of the world. Uh, but I mean, as of now, as I said, the metals looked good. We, we've added a couple. Uh, as far as the market is concerned, uh, yes, I mean, while I'm cautious uh, about the next one to three months, uh, that doesn't mean that you should be out of the market because I always say that uh, there's a risk of being invested in the market, which is a risk of a downside, but there is also a risk of not being invested and missing out of an, uh, on an up move. And up moves often happen when you least expect them to. So unless there is a possibility, of, you know, very clear possibility of a big crash, which I don't see, uh, it is better if you, if at all you want to do anything, you can hedge a bit. We were hedged up until now. Uh, those hedges expired. We are just reevaluating how many hedges, how much to hedge now. Uh, so, uh, but we, we definitely are not making a big cash call, and uh, we uh, plan to be mostly invested. In terms of sectors, I've often spoken about capital goods, industrial metals. So we've been trimming every quarter, but we still remain overweight. Uh, last uh, calendar, from uh, beginning of 2023, we went overweight autos and pharma. We've added in both these spaces in this uh, rebalance also. We have will be a little overweight construction. Uh, so broadly, that's what we have done. Uh, no, IT is one space I'm watching for bottoming out uh, this year. Uh, but again, you know, still waiting for the signals for that to happen. Hmm. Any any hmm. early signals? No, not yet. Yeah, I mean, we, I expect sometime this year that would happen. But uh, uh, right now, we are not overweight. Chemicals, and that's another global sector, especially agri uh, agri-chemicals. Uh, we'll, I mean, right now, our systems have not signaled any big names uh, I mean, uh, uh, there. We, we'll keep a watch. Again, it's a volatile uh, area. And also, see chemicals, uh, while we talk of it as a chemical overall segment, often what happens is that something which is good news for one segment of the market is bad news for another segment which uses that product as an input. So chemicals, you have to go into details about every company's uh, uh, product list and what's happening in each of those things. So it's it's not a sector where uh, I think broad calls work. Uh, it, Devina, just coming back to the larger theme, right? Uh, there is so much talk about de-dollarization right now in the global markets, especially with what's happening with uh, with gold. But this is uh, this is a narrative that has been going on for a while. How are you looking at all of this and how do you think markets like India could either benefit or fit into the scheme of things if de-dollarization plays out? I don't think it's going to happen in any meaningful sense. And as you said, these are narratives, which means they are stories and stories always follow what's happening in the market. And I'll take you back to 2003 to seven when emerging markets did so well. Emerging market index went up three and a half, four times. India went up six, seven times. And at that time, also, you had heard that the U.S. is over and this is now going to be the century of India and China. That's when BRICS was coined. And But as soon as the outperformance of emerging markets went away, all that story was forgotten. So de-dollarization is not going to happen in a hurry. It has, you know, even over decades, very little of that has happened either in terms of uh, how much of the trade is built in dollars or in terms of how much of the central government, central bank reserves are held in dollars. And really, if you look at it, what are the alternatives? Euro to an extent is there, which, which anyway is used or a little bit of Swiss franc. But uh, still, dollar remains the major currency. And if you're talking about the Indian rupee, for instance, becoming an international currency, I mean, think about it. Who would want to hold Indian currency beyond the point that you are importing from India, which is what happened with Russia rupee trade, that beyond a point, Russia said, what are, what are we going to do with the rupees? China has a better case simply because they export so much. So, you know, therefore, their currency is acceptable in more places because the countries can use it to import something from China. Uh, but on a you know larger scale, I don't see that happening in a hurry. So this is why all you, story. Okay. And why are you not in the camp of a commodity super cycle, Devina? Again, see, this is super cycles are all stories. If you go back and uh, look at the same people who are talking about super cycles, when had they said it last and what happened? 
So normally that doesn't, you know, uh, commodities, as I said, uh, hurt a lot more people than they benefit. So commodity bull markets are typically something people don't like, unlike most mm. other bull markets, and therefore difficult to sustain. And uh, so, I mean, stories can be formed anytime, but I don't see that like as a, it, it happens for a period of time. I'm not saying it will, you know, the commodity prices may not go up for a period of time. I told you I have be bad at metals. But I don't believe in these like ten-year cycles of commodities. By that, uh, by that, uh, Devina, by that so same token, would you agree that this entire narrative, and I would call it a story as well, that China is going to disappear uh, as a viable market for investment managers and and, and uh, you know ex-China funds, etc., will be the new th uh, thing? You think that's also a passing fad? Uh, sorry, I, I missed the first part. What what would disappear? What, uh, no, what uh, we're talking about stories, right? We're talking about right. st uh, stories yeah. and how they really play play out. Sometimes they do, but for short periods, as you said. Uh, so yeah. the, uh, this narrative, right? China plus one, and then uh, uh, take China out of the equation, uh, and the ex China ex uh, EM ex China funds. Uh, do you think that is also a kind of a passing fad, a story which? Uh, China perhaps is just too big to ignore in that sense. Uh, briefly, Devina. Yes, of course. China is a very large market, even on an overall sense, not just in a. Of course, it's the largest in the EM, uh, and uh, you know because it has not been doing well. Uh, that is when people say that you know just take it out, and uh, that yeah. one is closer to the bottom of uh, that market rather than the top. So, uh, as with all themes, theme uh, any kind of thematic. Uh, funds or schemes come near the peak of the cycle, or in this case, uh, because you're taking out China, you you can say it, it's probably a signal that China is closer to the bottom. Absolutely, and I think that's an important uh, framework to remember. Uh, thank you very much, Devina. Great to have you with us here. Great chat as always. Appreciate your time here on CNBC TV 18. Thanks indeed. Well, uh, that's uh, Devina Mehra with uh, thoughts on markets, uh, global markets, commodities, the market here, sectors she likes and everything. We'll take a break here. Uh, Mitesh will be with us with some technical trading ideas on the other side. So we'll talk about here and now. Nifty's up 40 points. Stay with us. Welcome back. All eyes are going to be on Zomato, whether it crosses that 200 rupee mark. It's gotten precariously close to that, 198. The high today was 199.6. Uh, that's uh, the intraday high on Zomato, 199.6. So will it touch the 200 rupee mark? It's had a fantastic run. Zomato is up 60% in this year itself. Mitesh is now back with us um, to you know walk us through the day so far and the way ahead. Mitesh, your 10 a.m. calls. Yeah, see, I think the day has been quite positive and the good thing is that the back nifty is staying positive. I think, you know, I expect uh, the strength might uh, remain. And in that sense, yesterday's low for the back nifty becomes a trading stop loss. Having said that, uh, Castrol is something which has been enjoying a good momentum and today is uh, seeing continuation. So buy here, keep a stop at 218 half, look for targets of 240 in the short term. And other one is the mid cap uh, stock, uh, uh, you know, the Brett is also showing good momentum. So NLC India is on my radar. Uh, the breakout happens at 239 uh, half, 239 levels. So I think buy above that with a stop at 230 and look for a target of 265. All right. Uh, thanks a lot for that. Well, uh, let's uh, shift our focus to the commodity markets where all the action is really for the last many days and weeks. Uh, so Manisha has a hands full. Manisha, what's the one commodity you're tracking today? Well, it's difficult to do that really, Sonia. So while gold and silver are trading at an all-time highs in the Indian markets and the international markets as well, but I do want to talk about industrial metals right now because the strong manufacturing activity that we are looking at globally seems to be supporting this. So when you look at the manufacturing numbers from US, China, Germany, all of that has improved quite strongly and that in turn has been supportive. I want to start talking about zinc first because the latest outperformance has come in from this one. It's trading at a one-year highs right now and we are trading above $2,700 a ton onto this one. The reason that zinc prices are in support because there are reports of various mine closures in Australia and Ireland as well. 
In any case, the zinc demand seems to be improving, especially in Europe and China as well. The other metal on your screen clearly should be copper because this is where it all started. LME copper is trading at a 14-month high. There is a very strong fund buying that we've seen. If you look at the Chinese copper prices, they are trading at an all-time highs. When you look at the US copper prices, well, they are trading at a 16-month highs. So when you look at the global markets across time zones, copper seems to be doing well in each one of them. We also are looking at stronger strength going forward. Also, when you look at LME and Shanghai right now, the gap is the widest since 2013, and there's a lot of arbitrage opportunities and trades that we are seeing happening between both of these exchanges. And this is what the brokerages are now saying. City for one sees copper at 9,700 in three months and at $10,000 a ton by fourth quarter. City also has a report suggesting that $12,000 of an all-time high copper is what you could be looking at in the next year as well. So this is not a short-term rally by any chance or standards that you're seeing in copper. Goldman Sachs also is talking about $10,000 a ton of copper and they expect that price in this year itself. So very strong going when it comes to copper prices there. Well, platinum is another one and the prices are trading at a four-month highs onto this one. In the last three trading sessions, we've seen platinum prices gain up by 12%. So $1,000 an ounce is back in case of platinum. Tin is trading at a 15-month highs. Indonesia has restarted mining, but there are concerns about regulatory approvals going forward and that is keeping these prices in favor as well. So as I said, everything from copper, zinc, tin, lead, nickel, aluminum is trading in the positive and at multi-month highs. I also want to take you through on what we've done in the previous one week when it comes to many of these metals. So copper is gained up by 3.5%, but copper has been gaining for last five weeks now. Aluminum, similar story, 1.5% up in this week as well. Tin has surged up recently, so 7% of gains onto this one in a matter of a week. And when you look at the other metals, Zinc is up 7.5%, lead 7, nickel 7.5%, and all of this movement in these prices has happened over the last six or seven trading sessions itself. All right, uh, Manisha, thanks very much uh, for that. So uh, commodities really, uh, you know, uh, seeing a lot of uh, move across the board. We'll take a quick commercial break here. We've got another very interesting chat coming up, right? Uh, water, that's the big, next big problem over the next uh, many decades and how to solve for that. Uh, so we have Rajiv Mittal, Managing Director and CEO at BA Tech Vabak joining us. And we also have uh, one of the foremost infrastructure analysts, Vinayak Chatterjee, founder and managing trustee of the Infra... Uh, InfraVision Foundation. We talk about uh, you know what can be done, what is being done, uh, and of course, what are the opportunities uh, as uh, companies figure out ways to solve this problem. Stay with us. Welcome back. Uh, you know, we're talking about uh, perhaps what's going to be uh, talked about quite a bit more over the coming years, which is uh, the water crisis, right? Uh, now, uh, companies, of course, are <clears throat> lots of companies are dedicating themselves to solve uh, for the problem through various ways. The government of India, of course, has been uh, sort of involved quite heavily now over the last couple of years as compared to any time in the past. So let's actually dive into this topic uh, in some detail. We have Rajiv Mittal, Managing Director, CEO at BA Tech Vabag. We also have Vinayak Chatterjee, Founder and Managing Trustee, the InfraVision Foundation. Gentlemen, great to have both of you here. Thank you very much uh, for your time. Uh, Mr. Mittal, uh, let me start by sort of take, uh, the, taking the first question to you. Uh, you know, <clears throat> at VA Tech, from what I understand, you are uh, betting big on uh, sort of, you know, uh, you're betting big on uh, uh, taking uh, desalination, right? That's essentially the big uh, bet that you're making at this point in time. That's right. Uh, how is this different as compared to what you did 10 years back? Because I remember back in 2000 2013, 2014, uh, there was a lot of excitement around your company, around what the potential is, because the problem was well understood even back then. And then, of course, things kind of uh, did not go as planned. Uh, investors especially are making a big bet on you and the theme once again. So what has changed in the intervening 10-year period, Mr. Mittal, if you can start by asking you that? Prashant, good morning and good morning to your viewers. Uh, uh, Vinayak also, good morning to you. Nice to see you here. See, I think uh, the question is uh, relevant today and it was relevant 10 years back and I'm sure it will be relevant uh, 10 years from now. 
the things what has changed is uh, in last 10 years, there's more awareness on this topic. Even if you see our first diesel plant in Chennai for municipal corporation was way back in 2010, which we completed and commissioned in 2013. So this is not new. And Chennai gives us the opportunity, even recently Chennai has placed uh, Asia's largest order, which was JICA funded 400 MLD, four times bigger than what they had built about uh, 13 years back. So I think we have to realize that water, fresh water is a limited resource. And where do you get it? You are all so much dependent on weather and with all the climate change happening, the rainwater is becoming highly unpredictable. And we can't develop our economies, we cannot develop infrastructure, communities need water. And with our standard of living going up, our consumption of water patterns have gone up. The only reliable source we have to look at, which are the perennial source. 97% of the water on earth is in seawater. And it will be, I think, sad if we don't tap that seawater, which is a perennial source, reliable source, drought-proof source. And today, it's also affordable. It, it, so, Mr. Mittal, that's what that's what my point is. Is it affordable now? Is it vastly more affordable, these plants, as compared to where, what they were 10 years back? See, point, if you talk about affordability, 10 years back also it was affordable. It's the prices have come down with the technology is moving up. The power right. consumption has come down. The power cost has come down. The quality of products have improved. The cost of running these plants uh, mm -hmm. has come off quite a bit. Got that. Mr. Mittal, I'll just come to you. Let me get uh, Vinayak into the conversation as well. Mr. Chatterjee, uh, talk to us. About, is is uh, desal, as uh, Rajiv uh, put it, Mr. Mittal put it, the accepted solution now uh, as far as uh, you know, this uh, solving for this problem is concerned, water? Well, it is one of the solutions. So, <clears throat> but to answer your question, I will need to step back a little and talk about four buckets of solutions. The four buckets, one is geographical interventions, second is policy interventions, third is micro-level interventions, and the fourth is technical and technology-related interventions. So if you just give me a few minutes, I will just bullet point some of the key issues in each of these buckets. Let's take bucket one, which is the geographic solution. And I'm looking at India, the country, and the economy as a whole. Remember, we have had developments like the Rajasthan Canal, which has seen the greening of the desert from North India, Northwest India, right up to Gujarat. We have seen the commencement of river linking projects very recently with the Ken Bethwa River linking. These are major interventions to take water into arid areas and impact livelihoods. Second, in the past, India has been a leader in multipurpose hydro and dam projects. Think of the Damodar Valley project, which conserved water by controlling floods. You actually harvested and stored water, which otherwise would have led to the flooding, useless flooding, of a large portions of Bihar and Northwest West Bengal. So these are, these are examples of geographic interventions on water conservation, water management at a country level. Then very recently, three months ago, very interestingly, since India's independence, the first ever census of water bodies was published. That has turned the spotlight on how we, first of all, do we know how many water bodies there are in rural and urban India and what do we do about them? Because as you know, water bodies are a very severely neglected source of water supply to communities. And finally, in many rural areas, there is the whole movement of check dams. Now, all of these relate to geographic interventions to address the water shortage issue. Come to policy. Policy, the biggest dampener on policy on, on water sector is the free power given to agriculture. Because farmers use it randomly, wantonly, and it reduct and it is documented that it has led to the reduction of water tables across large portions, certainly of Punjab and northern India. Then there is the issue of urban planning. How seriously do our town planners 
pass plans for townships, industrial complexes that choke water bodies as well as channels. And the floods in Madras are a testimony to lack of discipline and oversight by urban town planners and town managers. These are policy level interventions. Come to okay. micro. Come um, to micro. Mr. Mic Chatterjee, uh, uh, yeah. let me just get Mr. Mittal into this uh, conversation as well, right? Um, about all the uh, policy interventions that are happening at the moment. Mr. Mittal, you know, by 2030, the water demand in India is projected to be twice as much as the supply. And that's quite concerning. Do you think enough uh, processes are put in place, both on the private and the public sector end, to set up these comprehensive water, wastewater treatment facilities? And what more do you think needs to be done? I think, Sonia, it's very clear. We as water managers, that is our job to get these challenges, what you mentioned, the demand is far exceeds what supply is. And that's where we come in. We come in, what we call it, into a manufactured water. We just don't depend on the natural water which we get as a God's gift by rains or from glaciers. This is hardly any water. If what you just now said was on desalination, that is one solution, at least for all the coastal cities. India has a vast coastline, about 7,500 kilometers. Why can't we set desalination plants when Chennai has demonstrated this viability, economic uh, it is, and is affordable, and it's reliable because it's drought proof. The second one, which I would like to emphasize, which is even more affordable, is recycle of water. We have to realize water is a limited resource. We just cannot abuse water. We have to conserve water. Why we are not recycling water when globally this is well accepted? And at least you start for the industries and agriculture, which consumes almost 98, 99% of our water. You talk about supply. And just hardly 2, 3% goes to a domestic consumer. For domestic consumer, we can use desalination water. For all other, we can use recycle. And that is also infinite resource. It's a drought-proof resource. It's also reliable, affordable. So my short answer, Sonia, to you, yes, we have solutions and we can build a water secure, not only India, but the whole world, we can build a water secure uh, in terms of water availability. Mm. Uh, Mr. Mittal, uh, you know, if I can sort of ask you to distill from the macros to the micros with regards to your company, because, I mean, a lot of the audience is, uh, will also be investors in your company. Uh, could you tell us what is the order book at uh, Vietech Webag right now? Uh, what yes, do you sir, expect uh, it to... Yeah, sorry, go on. It's uh, more than 12,000 crores. Okay. And a substantial part of what we are discussing today is desal and water reuse. What's... And Got it. What's the what's the visibility uh, in terms of water pipeline from here? I think uh, we are very bullish about water. You know, mm. we are a pure play water company. Other than water, we don't do anything. If you even right. see globally, water is a big topic and India is second to none. There is a huge opportunity. So we will not be short of uh, opportunities in terms of water. What percentage mm. of your order book comes from municip uh, municipalities, uh, local organizations? Because, I mean, you know, uh, that, that was where back, I mean, I think eight, ten years ago, uh, receivables, etc., had become a bit of a problem. Could you tell us if that is kind of a shift moved away uh, in, in quite a significant way now, Mr. Mittal? Yes, it has. I think, Prashant, you have seen yourself that uh, if you see last three, four years, we have been always cash positive. So those mm. days are gone. There was a change of shift of strategy. Our uh, selection of projects was all about the payment security. If you see 98% of our order book is today based on multilaterally funded projects, uh, central government funded where we have a sovereign guarantee and for international projects, we have a letter of credit. So those days are gone. I think if you see in the last four years, I think we are back on cash positive. We generate free cash and uh, this is the way we want to grow in future also. Mr. Yes, Mittal, you had put out a number. Actually, the re reported number is about uh, revenues are about 3,000 crores last year. That is FY23. We'll get the numbers for this year shortly. Uh, uh, once again, going back 10 years, you had put out a revenue target back then uh, of uh, a billion euros, uh, right? Uh, is, is, is that still kind of the aspirational number? I mean, and, and 
is is the is the road looking a little more f firm now i mean yeah it is yeah. Uh, see it is always firm when you drive on the road you don't know sometimes the speed breakers may come or potholes may come this was like covid potholes coming which has taken the whole thing 3 years back but our targets are firm and we don't have a year when we want to achieve it so we want to do it earlier than later but we also have to be aware of all the geopolitical challenges which are there in the thing we want to reach our target in a healthy way rather than reach a target and then we say why did we reach so we uh, so, uh, are aware of our target and we are moving towards it and the opportunities are immense Uh, all the best for that but mr vital one final question in terms of fy25 fy26 what kind of average revenue growth are you looking at and will it be disproportionately higher to what you've seen in the recent past purely because how demand supply dynamics are playing out see sonia we have always looked at 15 20% cagr growth but you should also be aware because of strategy some of our stagnant european subsidies we have divested so those revenues which were there a year back you will not see it now but because of a huge order backlog we will continue to grow in that range of 15 20% cagr and we are very confident we have moved also away from c the construction we are going to more focus on technologically challenging jobs and doing more engineering and procurement of key components which is where we bring a differentiation in the market Okay all right uh, well gentlemen thank you so much for joining us we've run out of time not out of questions but thank you for uh, you know putting some light on this extremely serious and important topic about water shortage not just in india but globally and how some of these players are big beneficiaries of that especially in the water desalinization space that's a wrap on bazaar chartbusters coming up next do stay tuned in